Good evening. I think we will go ahead and get started with our standing committee meeting. And I want to welcome everyone to our uh, March 27 Public Works and Safety Standing Committee meeting. And I want to thank um, Commissioner Stites for uh, subbing in for Commissioner Johnson. Thank you very much. Before I call the meeting to order, I want to announce that some committee members, staff, and public are attending remotely by Zoom as well as on site, and all participants joining electronically should mute phones when not speaking to avoid any background noise. During the meeting, we would ask that you announce yourself by name and title when you speak so that the public that's observing knows who is speaking and when you are speaking, um, <laughs> make sure that you speak into our microphone um, so that all the comments can be heard and recorded uh, for the meeting. This is critical given the number of remote participants and its current guidance from our Kansas Attorney General. The public is invited to participate by Zoom or submit comments by email prior to our meeting, and those are included in the record of our meeting. The public can also indicate their intent to provide remote public comment by contacting our clerk's office by 5 p.m. on the Thursdays prior to our meetings or have an opportunity to provide brief remarks either uh, electronically or from our fifth floor conference room here in person. And with that, I will call our meeting of Public Works and Safety Standing Committee to order and ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Roll call, Groneman? Here. Kane? Here. Markley? Here. Johnson, we have an absence memo. Ramirez? Here. Bynum? Here. Stites? Here. Thank you very much. And tonight, just make note, please, that in our order of business items, we're going to flip seven and eight. So we'll hear eight before seven. And I'll have uh, Jeff Fisher remind me of that again. If I get to item seven and try to proceed, we'll actually do item eight before seven. Other than that, we don't have any uh, revisions on our agenda and we have no minutes to approve. So we can move right into our committee items. And the first one is FY23 COPS Technology Program Grant. And is Laura here? There you are. Come on up to the table. She's a fiscal analyst with the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department. And she's gonna tell us about this COPS Technology Program Grant, and we also have Keith Oakman. Welcome. Knows what it costs, and I know what it is. All right. <laughs> it gives me great confidence that you know both of those things. So, Two you. most important things. Okay, please proceed. Yes. Hi. Um, yes, as Commissioner Bynum said, my name is Laura Cromwell. I'm the fiscal analyst for the police department, and here with me tonight is Chief Oakman. The police department was recently named in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023 as a grant funding recipient under the fiscal year 23 COPS technology program. Funding for our department has been designated in the amount of $905,000 to support the further establishment of our real-time intelligence crime center. There is no UG match requirement for this program, um, and we are just here to seek approval to apply for and accept this award. And I'm going to turn it over to the chief to share a little bit more about this grant program and the specific items that we plan to fund under this award. Yeah, if, if you had heard lately uh, about a couple months ago, uh, U.S. Senator Jerry Moran secured $11 million for the state of Kansas for law enforcement. Um, Kansas City, Kansas Police Department was one of 11 jurisdictions that would receive a portion of that $11 million, which ours come out to $905,000. So real quick, I'll go through kind of what we would use those funds for. Uh, NIBIN, which stands for the National In Integrated Ballistic Information Network. So you'll probably hear me say that quite a bit in my tenure at KCK Police Department. And basically what that is, is new technology that came about the last five years where we trace shell casings to determine if they're connected to violent crime or as well as they're connected to weapons. 
Um, the significant thing about this is Kansas City, Kansas Police Department has one of the highest NIBIN rates in the Midwest, and that's compared to St. Louis, Chicago, Omaha, Kansas City, Missouri, and Wichita and Topeka. Uh, that's a good thing. That's, that's not a bad thing. That means that the majority of our shell casings we can trace back to another offense, which helps in apprehending the suspect. So a microscope would be one thing that we would purchase for that, um, in addition to a NIBIN technician. Um, the ATF is putting, believe it or not, KCK recovers almost the most shell casings in the state of Kansas. And we're one of the few jurisdictions that doesn't have a NIBIN machine. So go figure. Overland Park has one, Topeka has one, Wichita has one. So we use KCMO and Independence on their NIBIN. So what this funding would allow us to pay for a NIBIN technician uh, for two and a half years, uh, and they would act, actually, the ATF is bringing in a new NIBIN machine in their headquarters north of the river that, that our technician would be exclusively available to use that machine. So that would cut down on the amount of time it takes for us to get those shell casings back when we're working a shooting or a homicide or a violent crime. Uh, and the next would be our real-time crime center, which um, one is a um, real-time crime center video wall. That whole back wall would be one continuous video monitor where we can put up several different locations to monitor cameras, or if we have one big event, we wanted one big uh, video feed, we could do that. So, and there's a lot of other things we can do with that technology. And then Flock, which is uh, 20 license plate readers uh, with a two year, um, for two years. Now, what's important about the Flock is we have another grant where we're going to implement flock um, gunshot detection. Now what's significant about flock versus shot spotters is flock you can add cameras as well as LPR. So if the shot goes off, we'll be able to go back whatever time we said, if it's 30 seconds to the video to see where the shot came from or who, who, who actually fired off the weapon and then the LPR, if there was a vehicle near, then we would get the license plate number and the location of where the vehicle was coming from. And then the next item is more uh, storage for our network. Uh, and that's about $194,000 because we are, uh, just like if you look around when you talk about storage with all the video, everything that we're storing, we get to where we're at a critical level. So this money will help us buy more storage, which would uh, help us along for two to five more years. Uh, and then a true narc machine, which is a machine that I don't know if you're familiar with it, but especially now with our increase in fentanyl, a true narc machine tells our um, drug unit detectives at the scene what's, what is in this substance, and it's instant. You put it on the machine and it tells you, if I put this bottle of water in that machine, it would say H2O and then whatever chemicals the wrapper is and the uh, container. Uh, so we have one and we'll, we'll be purchasing another. And then a mobile LPR trailer, which we can move around in different, as we get complaints, uh, if we get complaints in a certain area, we can then move that LPR to be mobile. Uh, and then mobile RMS, which um, we recently was able to uh, in issue smartphones to every officer in patrol to help with follow up. And so instead of calling 911, tying up the 911 system, now you can just call, excuse me, call that patrol car and say, hey, this car is back. You guys can come back. Uh, that as well as being able to eventually, if we needed to dispatch from the cell phones, you can with this technology. And I think that's it. And Laura's pretty good because we ended up at 904 999 
and 85 cents. So uh, we got 15 cents to spend. Chief, thank you so much. Uh, I'll ask if the uh, committee members have any questions. Uh, Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, Commissioner Bynum. Uh, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Laura. Um, I, of course, want to thank uh, Senator Moran for uh, being a champion for law enforcement and bringing this money to us. I just have a couple. Uh, wow, one. You answered one question for me already. Um, for the funding stream in general, what was the criteria that who uh, the criteria for how much the 11 jurisdictions got? Or were awarded. Well, this this started about oh uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, I met with um, when Senator Moran ac actually a week after I was sworn in as chief, Senator Senator Moran reached out to me and asked what could he do to help KCK, and uh, I sat down with him and his staff and kind of said these are some of the things we're trying to do from a technology standpoint, and that funding would help. So based on that conversation is kind of how they tailored the amount of money that we would need. Okay. Um, well, I thank you for that. I know our KCKPD and public works does do an amazing job of looking outside and leveraging state and federal dollars that are out there to be able to do what you do. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there other comments or questions from the committee? I just, I have a quick question. I have a couple of questions that I hope can be brief. Um, give us just a quick snapshot of what the Real Time Crime Center is and does. Okay. So basically, really a simple version is all of our technology would be in one area. Uh, and the objective is to use that technology as well as analysts. We have three civilian analysts and two um, officers that are intelligence specialists that would be housed in this real-time crime center. And their objective is to generate leads, solve cases by providing real-time analytic support to patrol and the investigative process to help reduce uh, crime and apprehension of violent offenders. And one thing that we're gonna actually do with our real-time crime center, you have a lot of them around the country that say they're real-time, but we actually will be real-time. We'll have an analyst monitoring the radio. So as a, for example, if a call comes out, you know, a shooting at I-70 and 78th Street, well, that analyst is then gonna get, in the, get on the air make contact with that arriving officer and say, okay, we have cameras here. We, we're looking, we're going back. We're going to see what we can find as well as with the shot spotter, all of that, and then be able to give them information. We see that there's a blue truck that was involved that's leaving the scene eastbound, but they're going to be able to do this real time as it's happening. That's awesome. I just wanted to make sure folks are aware that, you know, I think we're making some pretty significant technological steps forward, and it's really impressive. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I went back and watched the Law Enforcement Advisory Board meeting. You had shared some crime stats at that mm -hmm. meeting. I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't have them in front of you, but it strikes me that almost every category was down. Would you want to just briefly talk on that? Yeah, we, uh, what we did is we put in a violent reduction plan in January of 2022. And we start seeing some of the results of that when 2022 ended. Um, we were down 24% in homicides, 5% uh, in ag assaults, 5% down in ag battery, rapes were down 5%, burglary, uh, which, you know, oftentimes people, you know, we talk about violent crime because it's important, but the majority of the community is actually faced with property crime. And we saw a 27% decrease in burglaries. And so far year to date, we're at historical lows from January now to March the 27th. Uh, we are down in homicides 60%. We're down in shootings by 45%. In fact, as of today, uh, Topeka, Kansas have 60% more homicides than KCK. Um, so uh, that's all trending in the right direction. 
Um, and a lot of this is some of these things that we put in place, such as, and I'll, and I'll be real brief, but such as one thing that we're doing is our uncooperative victims. We're cross-referencing those with our gang affiliations. And when we're determining, when we see a match, we then do risk for retaliation. And that's where we intervene, whether we need to give them services, resources, or just knock on their door and say, we know what you're getting ready to do, and we're not going to allow you to do it. So those are some of the things that we're doing and that we have in place. But um, I can send each of you our violent crime reduction plan. I think we would all appreciate seeing that. So thank you for doing that. Um, Commissioner. Sorry. Thank you, Commissioner Redham. Um, <clears throat> just going to kind of steer away from well, <laughs> what you're here for tonight. But the, the intervention you just spoke of, how effective is that? Because I know I've seen that as a model around the country, other police departments doing that. How effective is that here? Is it, is it, does, do people actually follow with it or do they continue with well, doing I, the crime? I tell you the, the most effective part is when we intervene uh, because that, that looks like a lot of things. Uh, one, they know that, that we're on to them. Uh, we identify where they go, where they live, who they're having these issues with, and uh, we intervene. And there's other things we can do, too, such as if they're on probation or parole, uh, if they, you know, if they're a felon, then we can do things where we work with their probation officer or their parole officer to tell them, hey, this is what they're planning on doing. And we need some help to try to intervene in this. And that part of it's pretty successful. I think the part that's not very successful is getting the resources to them because there's really nothing to force them to take the resources. And that, that's what KC Nova, that's what caused KC Nova to fail because there was really not a carrot there to make you go to job training, to make you... Uh, go to parenting classes or whatever you may need to do, or drug treatment. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, it's great information, and I really appreciate everything you and your entire department, sworn and civilian, are doing for the community every day. It's clearly helping. And my request for you would be, and I will ask ACA Cobbins, perhaps next month we could have room on the agenda for an update on the cameras and how the cameras are working, working out. And because you mentioned mm -hmm. the network storage cost. And so we know that, you know, it comes with a high price tag. So maybe right. next month, if we could just, just a presentation. Is that on the body cams or? The, right, the body okay, cams. Body. Yeah. Any yeah. cams yeah. you want to talk about, but specifically. We, we have a lot of cams. We'll talk about <laughs> <laughs> all the cams. Um, so I'm just asking that as a request for next month. I think it would be important for us to have an update, but this item is actually here for a vote. So I would, okay. And let me do my little required steps and then we'll, then, then I'll hear your motion. Thank you. <laughs> is there, Clerk, did we receive any comments online? No comments were received. Anyone online requesting to speak? No hands are raised. Thank you. Anyone here in person that would like to speak on the item? Thank you. Is there a motion? <laughs> I think I heard a motion. Is there a second? I did. Yep. Thank you. So we do have a motion and a second on the item. Roll call, please. Roll call. Groneman? Aye. Kane? Aye. Markley? Aye. Bites? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Bynum? Aye. And the motion carries. Thank you so much. We have a, an ordinance authorizing our unified government to assist other jurisdictions during emergencies and disasters. And this is a request to fast track to our uh, Thursday night meeting. And we have Matt May and Susan McMahon with our emergency management department. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, um, Chair Bynum and commissioners and our wonderful staff. Uh, first of all, I want to mention, because I'll forget. Uh, is that better? Yeah. I usually don't have that problem. 
Um, I usually project pretty well. The uh, first one that's on the agenda, and it's a revision of an existing one, uh, is needs to be both a resolution and an ordinance. So what you might have gotten in your packets is just a little out of date in that respect, but otherwise the content is the same and the concepts the same. So what we're trying to do is this is a requirement by state statute to have on the books so that we can do the next piece, which I'll get into in more depth. When I was looking this up and looking at and going over with legal, uh, we agreed that it had been written um, right after it had been established as a state statute and some of the stuff was out of date uh, as far as, you know, it had a K, it didn't have a KAR assigned to it yet, all those kinds of things. So we cleaned a lot of that up, but basically this is just a renewal of something we already have. So I don't know, uh, Commissioner Maya, if you want to do these one at a time or do them collectively. Or... I will defer to legal because I wonder if they need to be taken individually. And can the legal department, um, I would recommend that they be taken up individually. Okay. 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 So go ahead and give them to us. And then if the second one is similar, but only a county resolution, we'll just adopt it separately. Okay. So that's the first step. Okay. Second step is the actual document that we want to adopt. This is something that in the emergency management world throughout the Metro, we've been working on for years to try and get some cohesiveness around what happens in real life is bad days happen. Uh, the best example I can give you recently is 2019 when the Linwood tornado came through. Chuck Bagaha, who's my counterpart in uh, Leavenworth, is standing out in the middle of K32 and, you know, debris everywhere. And he's looking for a little bit of help. We come. I mean, that's just our nature. But if it's going to be any kind of an extended event, in all fairness to everybody involved, there's usually some sort of compensation. We, we've got 20 dump trucks and operators and front loaders. That stuff gets expensive over time. Uh, in that particular case, Overland Park was actually able to give them everything they needed. And in 24 hours, they were every re road was cleared and they did a fantastic job. But what happens lots of times is these agreements are made at two in the morning, standing in the dark. And it, it sometimes gets a little muddy six months down the road when you're trying to sort out who do we owe what to. And so what we wanted to do is develop a template document that we could literally carry around in our briefcases or back pockets or whatever, and we could pull it out at two in the morning and write out, okay, you agreed to send me 20 dump trucks with operators and 10 front loaders. And um, we're going to do that at no cost to you, the juris requesting jurisdiction for the first 48 hours. And after that, we're going to have a billable rate, whatever that is. And we're going to go by FEMA's billable rates. And the advantage of that is because we have vetted this document through FEMA, it will not disturb our ability to get reimbursement. And that's really tricky. So uh, lots of folks have done this. Um, you remember the group who did it? They spent, it was the schools. Uh, oh, and Joplin. The schools in Joplin did this and spent millions of dollars and then found out they couldn't get reimbursement. Is that right? Yeah, so it can happen, and I don't want that to happen to us, and we don't want to have it in the region. We want to play nice with everybody, and so that's the objective of this. So this is nothing but a resolution saying that if we need it, law enforcement, fire, these guys have figured this out a long time ago. They've already got these mutual aid agreements in place, but for public works and some other groups that we share resources with, they don't. And so this is a great way to kind of nail that down, make sure that it's documented, make sure we've gotten everything approved ahead of time. So that's the second piece that we had on the docket. And then the last one is our uh, continuing extension of the state of emergency for COVID-19. Just a couple little stats. Hang on, I wrote them down so I wouldn't say them incorrectly. Um, if we continue this to May 11th, as we've asked for in this document, and I'll explain why in a minute, we will have been under an emergency declaration for 1,156 days contiguously. That's totally unheard of. I mean, times past the tornado event I was just describing probably was under a declaration for about five days total. So this is so unique, and we know that whole event was unique. But the upside was because there was a national declaration in place, and so long as we had one in place, we were able to request reimbursement through the PA process to to the tune as of today, $4.1 million has already been requested, approved, and received in reimbursement to the health department. Another $3.5 million 
is in the works. And we expect to get that, if not in all, at least most of it, because it's up to FEMA to approve each of those expenses. And we got to make sure we've done our documentation. In addition to that, anything we expend from today until May 11th that qualifies, we can apply. So rough numbers, $10 million by simply having this in place. And so I greatly appreciate the um, patience of the commission, understanding the commission to having this in place, but also I wanted always to have an opportunity to come back and explain what we're doing with it and why. And it probably will never happen again in any of our lifetimes, I hope. But there it is. Um, so that's the last piece we have. May 11th is a magic number because that's when the federal government has decided to terminate their national declaration. And so it's time to, to roll up the carpet, so to speak. And so we're ready to move forward and call it what it is now, which is simply an endemic problem, not a pandemic problem. So that's where we are. A little bit of normalcy maybe in all of this, but the bottom line is we're no longer going to be under a declaration. And so that's the explanation for the short time change, little extension in what we already had in play. And uh, then we're going to marry up so that everything we expend right up to the 11th can be submitted if it's appropriate. I will entertain questions about okay. any or all of those. Okay. Thank you very much. So if I'm tracking correctly, uh, Mr. Kuhn, I think we have item two is the city side ordinance. Item three is the county side. And then item four is this um, sort of finality on the emergency declaration. Correct. Is that okay? So uh, questions from committee. Uh, Commissioner Kane. Well, I, I didn't follow it the way you did. Oh, okay. <laughs> but the tracking number 212320 was the first one, correct? Uh, let me look and see if I got tracking number on here. It's on the agenda, I believe. Yeah. Yes, 20. Move for approval. We'll fast track it to uh, Thursday's commission meeting. Thank you. Okay. Right. And a motion and a second on fast tracking the first item. Um, and I'll ask the clerk if we've had any comments. No comments received. Thank you very much. Anyone in the room that would like to comment? Okay, roll call, please. Roll call. Groneman? Aye. Kane? Aye. Markley? Aye. Sykes? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Aye. Go to six to zero. Thank you very much. The next item is the county resolution of the same uh, effort, if there's a motion on that. Tracking number 212319. Move for approval with request fast tracking for the March 30th commission meeting. Thank you. Is there a All second? Right. All right. Um, roll call on that. Roll call. Groneman? Aye. Kane? Aye. Markley? Aye. Pipes? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Feinman? Aye. Go Thank you very much. Zero. Thank you both. And and we need, I think, to move on the uh, yeah, uh, pandemic. I'm sorry. We still have that one. Yeah. Number 212311. Move for approval, but this doesn't say uh, yeah. Yes, we would like to do that, please. But with a fast track. Okay. Thank you very much. Roll call on this item. Roll call. Groneman? Aye. Kane? Aye. Markley? Aye. Bikes? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Biden? Aye. To vote is six to zero. All right. Thank you so Commissioners, much. Commissioners, thank you very much. And thank you enough for all you've done oh. during this, this time. And it's what we do. Continue to do so. That's correct. I thank sure you. I hope the rest of our guests are as efficient and as fast as you can. <laughs> I understand. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Shaw, are you the next item? We have a resolution committing UG to funding our match for the mega grant with uh, KCMO on the Bi-State River Bridge Replacement Project. And this is also an item we're requesting a fast track. So we have Troy Shaw and uh, Reggie Lindsay coming forward and our CFO Debbie Johnsher and our Public Works Director, Jeff Fisher. So we got all the all the folks here. And okay. This is the is that this one or a different one? It's the one you have in your hand. It says it says Central Avenue and Kansas Avenue Bridge sites, and I will explain why it says that. Okay. And before you get started, I would just like to recognize and welcome our new county administrator. 
Mr. David Johnston, who stepped into the back of the room. Sir, I want to thank you for just taking time to participate or observe in the standing committee meeting process. Um, welcome you, and you're welcome, welcome to come up and sit in any chair you like. We are not obligating you to stay for any certain amount of time, but we're glad you're here. This is an integral part of the right. governing process here, and a lot of the work is done at the standing committee level, and I'll um, hand, hand the floor to you for any remarks. Well, like. just, just for the public's edification, um, this is my first day, so... Um, <laughs> Uh, time has not been my own. It was, Dave, you have to be here at this date, this year at this date. I just finished my one hour of decompression time that I was allowed to have. So, and then I was told, they want you downstairs at the fifth floor. Oh, okay, well, I'll get another adrenaline rush. So uh, I, I do uh, understand the role of the standing committees. Uh, it, it's an important part of our governing process and legislative process. Uh, we want our council, our commission, to be uh, in a position to make the best, most informed decision possible for the people they serve. And therefore, this is part of that process. Next step, public meeting. So uh, uh, the better informed our elected officials are, the better decisions they make for the public. So I uh, look forward to being part of many of these meetings over the coming years. And uh, again, I want to thank publicly to all the commissioners. Thank you for the trust that you've given me to serve in this role. Look forward to it. Look forward to working with all of you and working with for our citizens uh, for this great county, Wyandotte. Thank you. I'll sit in the back, though, okay. if you don't mind. Very good. Thank you so very much. We'll try not to put you on the spot with anything, but... Okay, Mr. Shaw, I will hand this to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Do we have a presentation? Hold up. And then the clicker. All right. Per uh, Commissioner Kane's request, I will try to keep this as brief as possible. Um, Obviously you're aware we're here to approve a resolution committing the city or the county unified government up to $30 million as a matching portion of the grant for Kansas Avenue Bridge. <clears throat> Given that that number is so large, I wanna give you a little background information and make sure you have all the information as it pertains to Kansas Avenue Bridge, as well as Central Avenue and other things that may impact that Kansas Avenue as well. So I just want to make sure you have that information um, before you make this decision. Um, so this is a, just an overall real quick look at Red Star is Kansas Avenue Bridge. The uh, blue dot is the Central Avenue Bridge and the yellow star is actually a project that you may not be aware of or may be aware of. Uh, we just found out uh, last couple of weeks that KDOT is getting ready to redo the interchange at 70 and Central. So what that means to us is conversations with KDOT, at least initially, have said, is Central Avenue Bridge going to be vehicular? And we said, we don't know yet. And they said, if it's not vehicular, that's a benefit to us, and it may be a benefit to the UG in some form or fashion. My mind leads to monetary, what that means, I don't know their design changes if that's not a vehicular bridge. Even if it's a pedestrian bridge, it changes their design, it saves them money, which could be a benefit to the UG monetarily. So I want to bring that up. We have a meeting, um, Jeff, I think in mid-April-ish sometime to talk to KDOT about that. So I don't know where that leads yet or what that means. I just want to bring that up as a point that um, sometime in the near future, the UG is going to have to make a decision on that bridge if we want any benefit from KDOT by not making that vehicular. Right or wrong, I don't know. I just want to bring it up. So we'll be back later for sure once we have more information. Um, I just kind of want to point that out. So this is just the area that they're working on, and they've just now started getting a consulting firm together on that um, and putting that together. So they reached out to us to say, just so you know, it's just coming up. So I want to let you know about that uh, before we get too far into things. Um, this is kind of KDOT. This is a slide that KDOT wanted us to present. They're looking at all our plans when they do this. They want to reach out and make sure we're involved in this and how we're working, um, how 
their project's going to fit with Sixth and Central, the interchange there, as well as with the Kansas or with the uh, Central Avenue Bridge and how all that works together. So they just want us to know that they're looking at it, they're aware, and they want us involved in that conversation going forward too. Um, this is roughly their time for that project. Um, so it's in KDOT terms, it's pretty quick. It's it's moving along pretty quick. If they're talking about um, bidding the project in 27, that would be roughly when they're planning on starting construction after that. So um, design portion of it will come along, will come along really quick. So we're just throwing that out there, knowing that in the near future, we're gonna have to look into that. Um, move on to the, the Kansas Avenue bridge site. We're obviously aware of this. This is the project that about this time, maybe a little later last year, um, we were a commission and we were directed to pursue the mega infra grant for the Kansas Avenue bridge, bridge project. Um, we've been working with KCMO and with the consultant to put that uh, grant application together for the past year. Um, we're anticipating they're going to release uh, that grant opportunity in the next few weeks um, and have that probably do at the end of May if they follow last year's schedule. Um, so we're, we've been working on this whole time, getting it, getting it forward. Um, real quick, you guys approved funding to make temporary repairs on that bridge. Um, these are a couple of the repairs that you will see uh, that we're going to make. Um, we say it'll be open in February 24. I'm optimistic it'll be done by the end of the year. Uh, we've went ahead and, and ordered steel before we've had the design done. We had the design done for specific parts, ordered that because that's a long lead time on a lot of things right now is the steel. Um, so we've actually ordered that before we've started uh, letting the project to get the contractor on board just to get a, a, it done as soon as possible. So we're working on that and that's the, the short-term repairs that we're talking about. So here's the, the mega infra grant uh, that we're working with KCMO on. Um, they're in about the same spot we're at right now. They're looking to do the same thing we are um, as far as getting commitment from their side formally uh, to submit that grant. Um, the project goes from Southwest Boulevard on KCMO's side all the way down to 7th Street on our side, the entire project. It will be connect two communities together uh, with this project. It'll be a complete street and bridge replacement um, tying those two communities together. Um, rough timeline for that, assuming, like I said, they haven't released that grant. We're just going off of what was submitted or what was out last year um, and bumped everything a year based off of that timeline. So um, it's a, it's a long-term project for sure. Um, this is set up as a kind of design bid build type project, a typical um, we're hoping to do uh, alternative delivery and maybe speed things up, um, save a little money as we go through that, but we won't know um, how that works until we get in further into the actual grant if we get it. Um, so what we're looking at, big picture, $150 million project is what this, this project is estimated at right now. Roughly half UG, roughly half KCMO. Um, the mega infra grant is a 60-40 match. So 60% of that's paid by the grant, 40% is paid by local, which would mean 20% would go to the UG approximately. So 20% of $150 million is $30 million, which is where uh, we come to that number. And you can kind of see a breakdown here. We've uh, sat down with budget and finance. Um, Reggie's up here, Debbie uh, has been involved. Um, and we've thought of, how do we pay for this thing if, if we, it comes to the point where we have to spend $30 million? So there's a couple different uh, possible sources um, from the non-UG non and then UG sources. Um, one of which I'll note uh, that will actually be brought to standing committee probably next month is uh, you see the uh, K-5 ownership turn back. Um, we have been ta in talks with KDOT the past few years um, and figuring out how to take over K-5, which is Leavenworth Road, between 435 and 635. Um, we already maintain it. It's basically our road. Um, there's some nuances in there, but KDOT's offered us approximately $4 million to take that road back um, along with a couple other things. But to this, we would recommend if we do that, committing those funds to Kansas Avenue, um, storing them. Commissioner. And why don't you tell them how much it costs a year to maintain Leavenworth Road and why we would wanna go ahead and take it over? So <clears throat> I couldn't, I can't tell you exact cost per year, but what KDOT offers, here's probably where you're going with, I'm guessing, is what KDOT offers is up to $98,000 a year in maintenance expenses for that. So it takes 50 years to actually make that up. So it's a good deal long-term for the UG even. So I think that's where you're going with it. So 
um, yeah, so that's why we'd be considering that, but we'll, we're, we're working on getting an agreement with KDOT um, and we'll be back with that agreement for your consideration. Uh, hopefully next month is uh, what we're hoping for. Um, we'll consider, so the way the mega infra grant is also written is it offers 40% matching. However, it does allow another 20% of that matching to be federal funds as well, which is unusual. Most grants don't do that. They don't, you match federal funds with federal funds. So there's opportunity for us to pursue other grants or other opportunities as well to cover up some of that. So 15, up to 15 million of that, 30, um, with additional funding from the federal government as well. So we'll continue to pursue looking for other opportunities. And sometimes there's bridge specific opportunities or maybe complete streets opportunities that will cover different portions of that entire project uh, that we might be able to utilize. Um, and as you'll note, we start looking down at UG funds and, and what we have in there. Um, I'm hopeful that the top one is remaining bridge repair funds. I'm hoping that comes in under what we estimated. And then some of those funds will be able to use. We won't know until we get it bid, um, but the steel was cheaper than I thought it was gonna be. So I'm crossing my fingers, hopefully that uh, the rest of it's gonna be the same way. Um, Obviously, uh, you approved a stormwater utility fund last year. This is obviously a bridge over a river. Um, there will be stormwater improvements along the street as well on, on, on our side. So there's opportunity to use or rearrange some of that fund how we had planned it. But if we get this and need to supplement some of that, there's possibility to use some of those funds as, as well and then restructure how we had planned uh, the stormwater fund out the next five or 10 years. Um, and then obviously there's other funds, uh, city debt, general fund, there's cash sales tax fund, there's a street and highway. Some of those funds can be switched around if you had to take it. Um, I'm not saying that's ideal. We're just throwing ideas out of possibilities on how you fund this thing. If we got to a point where we got the grant, we have to find $30 million. Um, so that's just the information we we're putting together. So Really, in the end, what we're looking for is to approve a resolution that commits the UG to paying up to $30 million for our local share of the grant match if awarded. Oops. So this is a requirement of the grant for us to have a formal commitment. So there are a couple different ways that we could make that commitment. The one that made the most sense to us was a resolution just saying the commission has approved that we are willing to pursue this and fund this if, if it comes that we need to do this. Um, and then also I've obviously put on here with the grant will be, we have a template for a letter of support. If we wanna, if we wanna pursue it and, and continue to do this, I'll be asking help um, to get either support from you or support from others. Um, if you guys can help us do that, that'd be great. Um, and then I was the last one is advocate for any, any support we can get would be great. Yes, sir. I was with Emmanuel Cleaver last week and Sheree Stavis the week before and uh, they're pushing to get us some monies. Yes. And I think that's something that, that, that we need to keep in mind that, that there's other folks already involved and have been involved. <clears throat> and you got to remember the infrastructure money across, well, well, it's across the United States, but Missouri and Kansas. And I think this is a, a perfect item for that. So I would think we would get as, as those two are already working on it. Actually, he mentioned Central Avenue Bridge, but that's a different story. But I think that we, we need to do something to make sure that bridge is open and open for a long time. Right. So, Commissioner Stites, please. Um, when will Kansas City, Missouri, uh, when will their resolution go in front of their council? I don't know the exact date. I was told I asked about that. And they said they're working about the same timeline we are. So it and should what, be somewhere. What's our, what's our deadline on this as to when we have to have this in place? And the reason that I ask, is as we just heard a few minutes ago, um, our uh, new county administrator day one is today. And uh, I, I don't know if he's been brought up to speed on, you know, we're, we're looking at a $30 million uh, ask right off the bat. And um, so that's why I'm, I'm asking uh, when's the date and if he can be brought up to speed. Yeah, great, for sure. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think Mr. Johnson is definitely someone we need to get in the room and talk to about this. Um, so we don't know the exact date because I said they haven't released the, the application yet, but what they did, we're basically guessing off of what they did last year because it's a five-year rolling program that they would do. And last year it was, uh, roughly mid-April is when they released it and then they gave three weeks to submit. So we're kind of guessing off of that same timeline this year. So we want to have approval by the end of April 
um, on this, which is why we start here the next month, go to full commission. Um, so that, that gives us plenty of time to talk about that because we'll have to go to full commission as well uh, for approval. So it gives us a month before um, that's necessary to have that conversation. And if we want to change something during that time, we don't want to pursue it. We don't have to. So Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Ramirez. Um, that was on. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think what I'm going to do tonight is vote for it to, so that it can advance, but so that we can have a fuller conversation as a full board, um, along with staff so that all of us are there at the table and that we can have that conversation. Um, cause I, I agree with commissioner Stites that a lot. It's a $30 million. It's a lot for us to commit where we're already within our structural deficit and our budget issues. Um, and I know, and I, I thank our finance and our budget departments for looking into it and trying to find ways to put things together. Um, but I hope we get to the point in the future financially where we don't no longer have to pick and choose where we get funding from. I do thank you for what you do. Um, but I think it's just a fuller, full conversation with the full body needs to be had before I can fully say yes or no for my support for it. A couple of comments. Um, we've, we've been talking with Kansas City, Missouri and ourselves for a good while about the Kansas Avenue Bridge such that last budget cycle we um, allocated the emergency money for the repair to get one lane open. So I think the commission recognizes the um, need for the bridge, especially if there's the possibility that Central Avenue Bridge won't be, you know, could possibly be something other than vehicular. So it's, it's, the mega grant is an ongoing conversation that we started last fall. Uh, so I don't want to have the impression that, that we don't want this grant. We very much want this grant. I think what I'm hearing Commissioner Kane say is that there are possibilities that in addition to the actual grant award, that there could be earmarks that would help from Cherise Davids and or representative cleavers and or both that could further support the cost federally. And I'm assuming, I mean, you're probably getting those letters of support from those individuals. We've heard all the conversations about all the things that we do to strengthen our grant application, including all of our partners and et cetera. So I don't have to reiterate any of those components because I know you're doing that. We're talking about, once again, looking for the creative ways that locally our cash strapped government can still provide what we need and it's an up to. So I also don't want us to speak only in the context of finding 30 million because that's not 100% accurate. We don't know that that's the case especially if we're identifying the other sources of funding. Commissioner Kane. Uh, another person, Senator Marshall, is going to have an office at, at Fourth and Minnesota here in the next month or so. So I think we should get a hold of him and, and, and get one of those request letters and, and, and target that. So I, I guess I would just kind of wrap everything up by saying, you know, the action that we're requesting tonight is a, a resolution to support the funding, but again, it's an up to. So it's not a definitive, we have to go find 30 million. That's my opinion only. Yes, go ahead. And we're not even sure it'll be that much. I'm sorry. We're not even sure it'll be that much with, if we right. get the other parties to kick in. So there's a max and, and hopefully uh, with this new contact that we're going to have here pretty quick, you know, that, that we'll get more funding from them too. Yeah, and Commissioner Kane is correct, and that's why it is like to your point up to thirty million. I didn't want to throw out fifteen million because I'm going to do worst case scenario, and worst case scenario is up to thirty million, and that's what 
Um, unless we have other funding sources dedicated right now to it, that's what the grant will require us to commit to is anything that we don't currently have dedicated. So. Okay. And yes, did you have a, how many people use that Kansas Avenue bridge every right. day? About 8,000, I believe. And, and, how, and, and we've closed down, we're getting ready to close down some more bridges around town, right? KDOT is closing K-5. For the people in Kansas City, Kansas get to Kansas City, Missouri. Correct. I would agree. Thank you. I think that is the main point, let alone the other, as we all know, the other events and whatnot that are coming our way very soon. So it, it is critical. Um, with that, other comments? Um, anyone online with their hand raised? We don't have anyone with hand raised, but we did receive a comment. Okay, please. All right. This is from Rob Anderson in Kansas City, Kansas. The Central Avenue and Kansas Avenue bridges were built in the early 1900s. They were built for a different era when the West Bottoms was buzzing with flies and cows waiting to board trains to Chicago. At the time, the economic activity justified the construction of the bridges, and there were few options to get people, goods, and services across the river. Today, there are other ways to cross the Kansas River. Two options are maintained by the Kansas Department of Transportation, I-70 and I-670, and the James Street Bridge, maintained by the unified government. The average daily traffic on the Central Avenue and Kansas Avenue bridges are not significant when compared to the James Street Bridge and pales in comparison to the two interstate bridges. The community needs to ask itself some tough questions. If this bridge never existed, would we build it today? What transportation problem would it be solving? Can we afford to build this bridge? Considering all the other infrastructure needs in the community, will there be a dramatic change to economic activity to either side of the bridge? And will the delta in tax generation justify the expense of the project? Should we be in the river crossing business? Taxpayers in Wyandotte County should be wary of concentrating a huge portion of the capital budget to rebuild these bridges. The community should look to repurpose the Central Avenue Bridge for non-vehicular traffic if there is enough structural integrity to do so. The community should partner with Kansas City, Missouri to use federal dollars to replace the Kansas Avenue Bridge. Additionally, dedicating funds to this project will take away from the very limited budget Public Works has to repair box culverts and other short span bridges. Focusing the UG's limited budget into one capital, huge capital project might lend itself to a photo op ribbon cutting or bridge naming, but it does little to maintain the infrastructure that serves all unified government citizens. Personally, I live near these bridges and my commute time to the West Bottoms would be slightly improved with the replacement of the Central Avenue Bridge. That said, I consider it a terrible waste of taxpayer dollars when we have other needs. Thank you very much. Any person present in the room to speak on the item? And I just have one more clarification. So you do not need to fast track this. No, correct. We do not. So... I'm willing to hear a motion on the item. Move for approval. Mark Lee, second. Okay, excellent. Uh, roll call, please. Roll call. Groneman? Aye. Kane? Markley? Aye. Stites? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Bynum? Aye. The vote is six to zero. Okay, thanks very much. Um, item six. Who's going to present? Is this Mr. Fisher? Yeah. We have a resolution to fund 25% of our illegal dump program by the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. It's requested that this item is fast-tracked to the Thursday night meeting. Mr. Fisher, please. Good evening. Thank you. Um, this is a, a state program that we have been looking to access for probably a better, better part of a year. Uh, we finally now uh, can do this. We have three sites that Javier, our solid waste manager, is going to highlight for you real quickly. Uh, but it seems like a great program, great opportunity to clean up three very significant illegal dumping sites and uh, not spend any UG money except for uh, labor and equipment. Javier, you want to? There you go. And with evening, with evening, go ahead and just pull that microphone a little bit closer. closer. <laughs> there you go. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Javier. I'm uh, new here with the UG. I'm the new uh, solar waste manager. I haven't seen some of you guys. I mean, some of you guys already know. 
unfortunately, unfortunately, whatever the case is. <laughs> so, like uh, Jeff Fisher was talking, this is a, we are a solid waste is a requested resolution uh, to bring this project back. Um, I don't think we have done this project for like- It's been some, a while. Some, a while. I know they have been working with the previous manager for about a year on it, and we, we finally get in some uh, traction on it. So we're, we're hoping for resolution uh, only as soon as possible. Yeah, we have uh, three cleanup locations to, uh, to work with. Uh, we partner up with uh, KDHE from uh, the state. They're, um, they have a grant out there for $10,000. They pay uh, up to ten thousand dollars, seventy five percent. Them twenty five percent stuff that we had to pay. The next one, um, as shown in here, uh, the total cost for thirty six fifty one in Minnesota is eleven thousand four hundred eighty four dollars and thirty six cents. Uh, KDHE is going to pay eight thousand six hundred thirteen and twenty seven cents. We are for labor again. This is. Uh, no higher cash from us. It's just going to be labor, two thousand eight hundred seventy-one and nine cents. The same for the Minnesota one. It's uh, literally across the street. Um, to the total for that, uh, three thousand ninety-five dollars. Those are just the best estimates that we have. The worst case scenario, there's going to be uh, a little more fees here and there, but they're also um, like FEMA rates, and so it's gonna be, it looks higher than what's gonna be. Uh, the good thing is that we don't have to pay any hard cash. Um, the last one on the solder um, is, is higher, it's $22,824.52. Um, again, the, uh, the K, KDHE is only gonna pay $10,000 out of it. We're gonna, um, and labor is going to be twelve thousand eight hundred twenty-four and fifty-two cents. Again, just labor, uh, something that we're we absorb. Um, yeah, that'll be the last one. We're excited and hopefully, hopefully that we can um, have a resolution for these sites. And um, the idea is to get them started by mid June, and then uh, we have the opportunity to work with KDHE. Every 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 year, once a year, three sites per year. So, my goal is to do this moving forward every single year. And I believe we need this fast track, right? Okay, thank it's you. It's a fast track. Okay, Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, Commissioner Bynum. Um, could you explain for the, the public and those who are watching what what's done during the illegal dumping program and what's part of that? So it's cleaning up uh, mostly what ho uh, homeless people have left behind. So we'll, we'll bring uh, machines in there to open up um, trees and stuff like that, and then literally clean up all the, the, the um, tables, trash, many trash that's left behind. The one on the last one, Solder Drive, uh, there was an illegal dumping. Literally, somebody was dumping in somebody's property. So there is a lot of a lot of dumping. Literally, and vehicles were dumping. So that's that's why it's a bigger bigger number out there. So yeah, it's it's trash that we had to clean up, make it nice and neat. Yes, Commissioner Stites. So, um, how were these three sites selected across the? many hundreds of other sites that I could pick out. Just curious of how these got selected. And then also the follow-up question to that is what are we going to do once we spend this money and get them cleaned up to uh, stop it from reoccurring? Those are good questions. The, the, <laughs> <laughs> the sites were selected, uh, I think last year when Jonathan Gutierrez, his uh, predecessor was here, and I believe was working with codes, code enforcement to determine which were the best sites for this program. Well, I guess that would be my question is, how were they decided that those were the best sites? I mean, we got one location basically across the street from each other. 
and we have a whole county because this is coming out of the county county dollars that uh, or county uh, personnel that uh, these this just happens to be the, the sites that uh, we landed on and how will we determine the uh, the next year as you said the next three sites yeah I think I think being consistent and doing this each year uh, from here on out and moving and finding those locations throughout the county so we get that coverage uh, it's, it's, would be best practice for sure. Okay. And then what are we going to do to prohibit this from happening, happening again? Because, it, I mean, if we don't do something other than just go in there and clean it up and think that it's going to fix itself, I think that's a little um, ridiculous on our part. Uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know that I have a good answer for that. I mean, we've been working with codes enforcement. I'm sure the community and uh, policing has been involved with these sites. Um, Buckworks has just identified these sites, evaluated them, and accessed this state program to clean them up. I certainly could follow up with those department heads and see what we're going to do to. I like the them. idea that we're cleaning up locations. Don't get me wrong. I like that. I just don't want it to reoccur. Sure. And then in five years or three years or two years that we're looking at, Man, it, it happened again, right? And we're trying to figure out how to get them cleaned up. So I think um, prevention, whether it be with that we contact work with the police department and and what we need to do. I don't know who owns those those sites, but uh, maybe there needs to be some of this uh, put back onto the owner of the locations to prohibit this from occurring. I will follow up with them. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I would just add on to. Commissioner Stites question and, and comment to the extent, I think it applies to the 3600 Minnesota site, but it definitely applies to the 4600 sorter, you know the area. Um, the illegal dumping that has occurred there is not a new phenomenon that's been going on for 20, 30 more years and is has has been a continuous problem. Um, I think one thing positive I might say about that particular location is um, we do have active public works, community policing and code enforcement response up in that area, um, more so than probably ever before because we have neighbors who are willing to step forward and not basically not agree that that's an okay thing to have happening in their community. It's a very rural area. Uh, so it's very easy to hide there and do whatever illegal thing they are desiring to do. But we have more and more responsiveness from the residents who value what they've been able to obtain in that area and keep it Decent, so I would definitely speak to that one in terms of its. You know, there's some some preventative availability there, and I think commissioner's right as far as thirty six fifty and fifty one. We know that those are probably privately owned. I'm really not sure about the about the south side, but um, they probably both have private owners and certainly can. Try to be as proactive as possible about, you know, engaging those owners such that um, maybe it gets nipped in the bud sooner rather than later, if you will. Um, and I'm not so sure that there's an active neighborhood association nearby. That's why I keep looking at the commissioner. Um, I just am not sure, but um, definitely I think any... Any kind of, um, you know, interdepartmental communication with with codes and cops is gonna is gonna be helpful. I was just gonna say, it either died or I stopped getting invited. I think it died, but we used to have the lid group that was meeting. It was like the illegal dumping committee, and I think thinking back to the membership, I'm not sure anybody who was sitting on that committee other than the KCK PD representatives is still with the unified government. So 
it was a good committee. It had police representation, code representation, representation from public works, and all the folks were sharing information about the sites that they were seeing and how they were being handled and ways that we can improve that system. Um, I'd like to get back there eventually when we have the personnel to make that happen because I think it was beneficial. Thank you. That's great. And I had forgotten about the committee. So, um, you know, Mr. Fisher and ACA Cobbins, maybe you can um, just look into and Commissioner Markley can, can update you. Yes, sir. There is that committee is still in place. Oh, maybe it just doesn't have a commission represent, representative. Right. Next time we have it, I'll, I'll bring that up. Okay, and Commissioner Merkley was participating, which makes me think that she would be glad to receive an invite. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> well, the pandemic did a lot of things. So um, I will, other questions or comments from the committee? Just what's the reason that it has to be fast track? Uh, the uh, state needs this adopted or moved forward from the UG by April 1. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And Madam Clerk, any comments received? No comments received. Any hands raised? No hands raised. Yes, sir. Daniel, um, Commissioner Bynum, each resolution has a $2,500 max. So, uh, Clarification as to the in-kind dollar amount and possibly an amendment might be in order. 2,500 max as in, that's what we will spend or they will spend? So we'll spend 25% and they spend 75%. No. I heard two different things. So the, so KDHD will, they will, Pay up to seventy five, oh, up to ten thousand dollars. Okay, but I think I'm hearing you say something different. Yeah, each there is a dollar amount specified in each resolution that is up to um, a maximum of uh, two thousand five hundred dollars per site. Yes. Yeah, so in the case of thirty six fifty one Minnesota and for forty six hundred Sorter, um, that maximum would need to be changed. And so am I then, with regard to you, are we saying that the other dollars are in kind, such as labor? The, the amount, the costs above and beyond 10,000 or 75% would be borne by the UG and it could be up to 12,000, as you can see in the third case. So we need to probably just take the limits off of that because it's all in kind. It's just our labor and equipment. Oh, it's all uh, in mind. Yeah, right. that's right. Okay, so is there a modification to language that you would suggest in order to make sure that the resolution is appropriate? Uh, Commissioner Biden, Daniel, the department. Um, Commissioner Biden, I would suggest, uh, well, there's two ways. You can either remove the maximum or... Um, Put a maximum that is slightly above or would be approximately as to what is uh on the slide. 24, 24, 54. So maximum. Uh, well, I would. 436, Minnesota, UG cars. Yes. All right. I would suggest no maximum. Okay, so if we if we had a motion that modified the resolution. Commissioner Ramirez. <laughs> um, move to approve the resolution, striking language, uh, providing a maximum of $2,500. Does that work? Per site. Per site. And it'd be fast tracked to the March 30th full commission meeting. Does that? And for, to clarify, that would be removing that language from each resolution. Yes. Okay. Question. Yes, Commissioner. With, with doing that, if this was to, I mean, it's kind of like we have an open ended. No, we're not tied to twenty five hundred dollars anymore. You could go in there and spend 
$45,000. So I don't like that. Okay, but we can see that of the list, we only have one that is under $2,500 in cost. So I'm a little bit, frankly, I'm a little bit confused about the $2,500 language in the first place and how it's even in there. It, I, I'm just not following on how the $2,500 max per yeah. site was inserted in the first place. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure either. Um, these are estimates based on uh, the gentleman with the state's experience in cleaning up hundreds of sites all over, all over the state of Kansas and his evaluation of each site. He helped Javi and Jonathan, Jonathan before him create these estimates. I think if we were to get into something we weren't anticipating, uh, that's an operational decision I would have to then report to the county administrator, get some direction from him. That would be sort of normal practice. Do, do we know how... How the twenty five hundred dollars even got put in there? Who I recommended don't. it? Who? I mean, I somebody had to put this dollar I, amount in and there. And I'm just throwing it out, but I wonder if it's a template, you know, from Did something past that's been updated, and perhaps this particular portion didn't get either reconsidered or taken out. It does appear that this is a template from the state. Is that right, Dan? I believe it is, and yeah. that may have been a miscommunication between the legal department and right. public works. And frankly, when we had our agenda review on it, I don't remember any discussion of, you know, a, a, a max amount. There was wasn't. Mm -hmm. My memory of discussing this in preparation for tonight. So uh, let me ask this, Commissioner Spikes, would you be knowing that we're at about 13 grand on the most expensive one, would you be willing to insert a dollar amount of like 13 or 14,000 or 15 per yeah. as a max. I, I would agree. I just think that it needs to have some sort of a ceiling on it so that we, you know, yeah. And then we're mm -hmm. gonna take them one at a time, it looks like. It looks like we have a resolution for each, each address. So are we agreeable to a $15,000 max on each item? Yes, Commissioner Ramirez. Okay. Um, to change the motion to striking the language, but adding a 14000 maximum per site. That could be spent. Okay. okay. So is there a second on that motion? Barkley, second. More discussion or be ready to vote? Does it have to be the same? You could do it. You could do it. And the so 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 how about we do this? Let's take the motion on the first item, which is um 4600, right? So we'll take the motion on 4600, Commissioner Ramirez, if you're agreeable to this. Um, and that one is the most expensive, and you could cap it at the fourteen thousand. Yes. Okay. Um, Commissioner Markley, agree. Agreed. Let's do that motion for the first one in our packet, which is forty six hundred, and and we're fast tracking. And I'll ask for roll call on the item. Roll call. Groneman. Aye. Kane. Aye. Markley. Aye. Biden. Aye. Ramirez. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Vote is six to zero. Thank you. The second one in the packet in this order is 3651. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution changing the dollar amount, uh, the maximum from 2,500 to 3,000. And to be fast tracked to the March 30th meeting. Markley second. Thank you. Any other discussion on that one? Roll call, please. Roll call. Groneman? Aye. Kane? Aye. Markley? Aye. Sites? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Bynum? Aye. The vote is six to zero. And the uh, last one is 3650. Go ahead. Uh, uh, move to approve the uh, resolution changing. The maximum dollar amount from 2,500 to 1,000 and to be fast-tracked to the March 30th full commission meeting. 
Markley, second. Okay, roll call on that, please. Roll call, Groneman. Aye. Kane. Aye. Markley. Aye. Seitz. Aye. Ramirez. Aye. Bynum. Aye. The vote is six to zero. Thank you very much. All of that passes. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks for what you do also. Um, we are moving item eight instead of item seven right now. So item eight is the quarterly update from uh, Public Works. And I will ask Mr. Fisher to, to bring his team. Well, thanks again. Uh, this has been our normal practice of reporting uh, every quarter, uh, some of the highlights of what Public Works has been up to. And the most important thing for tonight is that uh, two departments were added to Public Works here recently. And so Chris Cooley with GSS is here to sort of highlight what GSS is all about. And in the future, we'll have Rhonda from Parking Control. Chris? Slides. Thank you. All right. Um, I want to introduce myself, Chris Cooley. I'm the Director of Geospatial Services. Um, we're the, the GIS and Mapping Department here in the Unified Government. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, our organization, what we do to support um, things across public works and across the Unified Government. Um, with the REORG, we were moved out of the Knowledge Division or Knowledge Department into Public Works, and that's where we live now. And so we're, we're continuing to serve, just as we always have. It's just, uh, you know, I work with Jeff now rather than, than Alan Howes previously. Um, like I said, we're responsible for the mapping. Um, we're responsible for sorting, supporting the, the mapping efforts and, and the data that, that is under, underlying that um, across the organization. Uh, the next slide. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is, is some of our values in the organization, some of the things that we look at. Um, and I'm going to kind of go out of order from the way they're presented on there. But one of the things that we, we consider and we consider in the organization is that geospatial data, so data about things that are occurring at a location, is a first-class data set within the organization, within the UG. Um, it's critical infrastructure. Um, you know, it's a different type of asset that we have. Our data is, is an asset just like our streets or, or our sewers or things that, that anything else that's going on in public works. Um, data is an important piece of, of, of that asset story. Um, and when you think about it, um, everything we do uh, operationally within the unified government is tied to a location. You know, we're delivering an appraisal, we're delivering a tax bill, we're doing an inspection, we're delivering a call for service, we're, you know, uh, fixing a pothole. Uh, we've got an asset there that we're inspecting or that we're maintaining. Um, so all those things are location centric. Um, and nearly every division or department has something that's tied to location. Um, you know, we have an XY coordinate uh, associated with it, or should be, at least there's an address or something like that. So it's the underlying piece of what we have um, in all the data that we have. And what we're, we've been trying to do with uh, in geospatial services as, as a group is unlock that and, and make that a, a consideration. So that's why I say considering a first class data set, it's, it's the first thing we wanna consider is that is this spatial in nature? How do, we, how do we look at it on a map? How does it add to the storytelling? How does it add to the decision-making, the policy-making that we have? Um, it shouldn't be considered in a vacuum that, that here's this one thing over here. We want to consider it in a holistic fashion. Um, so going to the others, um, you know, another thing that we want to do is, uh, it says be available everywhere and accessible to everyone. The analogy I use is, is that we want our technology and the things that we've been working on and building to be as accessible and ubiquitous as Microsoft Excel. Um, Certainly, you know, everybody inside the UG, you know, years ago when we adopted computers and PCs and our desktops, we got Microsoft Office and Excel became kind of the de facto list maker database and things like that. And then you guys certainly see people from finance that really know how to make Excel sing. Um, you know, there's people doing fantastic pivot tables and regression analysis and things like that that really unlock all the features that, that it has, not just using it to make a list. 
And I would like the same thing to be occurring with our mapping infrastructure is that there's people that just go and look at our, our, our web map, UG maps, uh, dot maps, those things. Go and look at it and they just want to see a location um, or they want to see, you know, let's say where all the parks are. Look at those things and say, okay, here it is. Here's, here's just a simple list, but in map form. And then there's things like, like some of the, the asset team has been do, doing done before you in the past where they're telling a story about the, the age of our infrastructure and the, the, the serious, you know, cost of delayed maintenance, deferred maintenance on that and what that, what that looks like in 10 years from now. So those are, those are very different stories that are being told. So our infrastructure, our pieces are very important to helping drive those decisions and tell those stories. So we want it to be everywhere. So the, all those people that it touches, we would like them to be looking at a map. And I think you guys would too. Um, the other things that we do is we can certainly turn data into information. And when we're doing that, we want to consider a, a mobile solution first. We do that through applications and targeted apps and stories and, and uh, you know, tools like that. Um, the trend in technology is that uh, it needs to be mobile first. And when I say that, I mean that it's accessible on a mobile device. You guys have probably been to websites on your phones that you have to zoom in on or are kind of clunky. It's because they're not responsive to a mobile platform like a cell phone. So we... We design with that that value in place, and then the other thing is that we're trying to adopt low code, no code solutions, things that allow us to do configuration over custom coding, uh, custom coding and development of any solution, uh, any application, or anything like that is very costly. Um, the long term impacts of it are, are difficult as as you have to make upgrades or add enhancements, things like that. You've got to pay somebody. Versus today, there are a lot of solutions that allow for, for configuration. It doesn't allow or require very much coding. You know, somebody actually typing lines of computer code that tell the computer what to do. It's more like you're filling out a form and telling it, look at this data here, display it in this manner. And that's the way we want to go. So those are kind of some of the values we have when it comes to uh, what we're looking forward to. And then the other thing I want to talk about, I think the next slide. Is some of our goals over the coming coming years. So one, um, you know, like many departments here in the UG, we've we've been impacted by um, some some people leaving our department. Um, had two key technical people leave us last year. Um, it's been challenging to hire those. Um, we do have them posted, and we're we're trying to to, you know, when we get a good applicants, do do interviews and 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 move forward with that. That's certainly one of our priorities is getting fully staffed. Right now, we're sitting at five, and we were at seven. Um, the other thing is, is that we do need to, to upgrade our infrastructure. Um, this would be, we're not, when I say upgrade, it's not that we're lagging, it's that we need to be making the upgrade to keep current with things. Uh, it's not, it's just an internal thing, but that'll be a focus of our time is making, making version upgrades to our underlying server software and, and the map services that, that, that rely on that. Um, Another thing we want to do is, is that, you know, it's, it's uh, challenging at times when we get a call that there's an outage or, or something like that with UG maps or dot maps. And it's frustrating to us as well as uh, the, the people that are users. So when we complete our upgrade, one of the things we're going to want to do is implement some monitoring tools to assist with, with ensuring uptime. Uh, let us get some statistics on usage. Let us get some statistics on, on where things are going out and be able to, to maybe notify us before the public might encounter something uh, or, or a UG department might encounter an outage so that we can respond in a more timely fashion. Uh, next page, please. And then um, one of the other things that, that we're uh, a key part of the tax administration group, uh, the tag group with uh, land records um, and, and parcel mapping, we fulfill the statutory obligations of the clerk and the appraiser. Um, and it, there's an antiquated workflow that probably goes back to the 80s at the very, very uh, minimum. Um, it's very paper driven. Um, there's been some, some ideas at, at times to, to try and do a digital transformation of that. We really need to step back and take some time and say, let's um, make this more efficient so that we're not handing pieces of paper back and forth so that we can really ask, do we, do we need to, to have these checks and balances in place? And if we do, we, you know, certainly things that are passing from department to department to ensure that a workflow is occurring in a proper manner. But this is, this is currently a very time consuming workflow between my office, the clerk and the appraiser. And it's, it's a, a prime candidate for a digital transformation. And so that's something that we're gonna be looking at in the coming years. 
certainly um, leadership training to empower our team. Um, one of the things that, that we were doing before the pandemic, um, you know, kind of shut down in-person training was we were sending staff members to the Emerging Leaders Academy offered by the KU Public Management Center. Um, I think that's an excellent program. I've seen um, very good results from people in my office that have participated in it with some turnover in staff and, and you know, after the pandemic would, would love to, to continue to get my, the rest of my staff through that program. Um, you know, in, in going with the things that, that Jeff, I know, has talked about in, in leadership within public works, us being a part of that team, you know, every member of my team should be empowered to be a leader. They don't have to be the manager of the organization, but they should be all be empowered to be leaders to, uh, to help drive the organization. So that's one of the things we're going to do. And then at the end of last year, we made an investment in significant technical uh, training uh, credits that we'll be using across the organization because we've, we've not only had, you know, two staff leave from my organization, but there's been a, a, a you know, handfuls of, of, of people leave from other departments in public works and health and NRC, um, that, you know, the, just to name a few, and there's probably a few others I'm missing, um, where we've had people leave and new people coming in or will be coming in that uh, could benefit from, uh, you know, detailed technical instructor-led training from our software vendor. Um, so anyway, I wanted to give you guys an update and introduce ourselves to you. Um, you know, we care about data. Uh, I know many of you care about data because it's the heart of making good policy. It's, uh, you know, drives data, just data driven decisions is something we, we talk about. Um, we talk about continuous improvement and improvement plans in the organization. And we want to be there at the, the table um, to help assist with that in whoever, whatever department is that, that may be doing it. We don't have to do it. You know, uh, we just want to provide the infrastructure and the, the tools and the support and some of the know-how. Um, they're, we're going to rely on them to be the, the subject matter experts in what they're doing. Um, you know, we're certainly probably subject matter experts in using data and helping them to, to maybe get the data to the next step so that, that they can present it and tell a story with it. So, any questions? Thank you very much. I, I have a lot of questions about the tax administration group, but I'll save those for another day and just maybe ask you for a, a meeting. Oh, okay. Um, certainly. So I have a a quirky, strange interest in that. So, uh, and But I appreciate, obviously, I appreciate you and, and all the work you've done so far. And, and I think it's great to integrate you into, into public works. So other questions for Mr. Cooley from the committee? Okay. Okay. Jeff. Yeah, thank you. I'm an important part of the organization. So we wanted to introduce you to the person who's been behind that. So continuous improvement. I uh, just want to quickly highlight, um, tomorrow we have our next leadership roundtable. Diana and the committee has been working really hard on that. We have 95 people going to attend that, which is a big, a big number. So uh, many or several that are outside the department. So we're real happy, real excited about that. Uh, Russ Owens, is behind me, was promoted to fleet manager recently, and he's going to give you a highlight real quick. I am Russ Owens. This mic. Huh. I'm Russ Owens, the fleet manager, Public Works. I want to briefly talk about the enterprise program. By the end of year 2022, this program made over 400,000 before payment. Could you speak up, please? There you go. Pull that microphone. Gotcha. All right. By the end of year 2022, this program made over 400,000 before payments. We have eight departments participating so far and plan to get more. Uh, this program has generated a substantial amount of savings on auto repairs. It's also raised our professional image as well as recruitment and retention tool. That's, I'm going to hand the rest off to Vinny. All right, pothole patching. So for the second year in a row, uh, 2021 and 2022, we patched over 28,000 potholes. So we think uh, since we've kind of reached that, we think that's kind of our max with the equipment and staffing we have currently. Uh, this will be our first full year with the spray patcher that you see pictured there. So that could increase a little bit with that. So that's a one person operation to patch potholes. Uh, as pavements decline, as we saw from the study in 2018, our PCI was a 56, and then 2022 is down to a 51. So the need to patch is going to continue to increase. 
so just a few things um, as this happens every year coming out of winter. We know, as Finney pointed out, we have a lot of potholes to repair. We have two full crews on hot patchers and we have the new machine that he mentioned. Um, so we just ask to be patient. We're getting to every pothole out there as fast as we can and making the best repair we possibly can with the equipment that has been afforded us over the last four or five years. Um, I think as we've, uh, over the last uh, recent months, um, we've, we have struggled a little bit to keep the momentum. Um, as has been mentioned, we have a lot of vacancies. It's been really tough to recruit. And um, I think that's been a challenge across the organization. So as we do our work and also work with the departments around us, it's just, it's been tough. And uh, the team has, um, has, has, it's been, it's been a tough experience, but an excellent experience at the same time, because it's been public works anyway. Um, we have really rallied around it and drawn from each other's strengths and uh, stayed strong, even though we've had moments where it was, uh, it was tough. And so I'm proud of the public works team and the people that we work with across the organization and keep, keep doing the work that you all expect us to do. That's our, that's our report. Comments or questions from the committee? So I, you know, I would, I would, um, I will say this in my working career, as I, we know that COVID dealt many challenges and then economic challenges during and immediately following and and you all have come to us on a number of occasions to explain um you know the rising cost of of uh, the materials that you need to do the work that we're asking you to do and the supply chain issues that you deal with in trying to do those <coughs> things as quickly as we want you to do them and um i've been impressed with how your department has, number one, answered our questions as truthfully and honestly as you're able. Um, number two, done as much as you can with the resources that are allocated. And I'm just saying for myself in my working career, as I have encountered challenges that certainly weren't on a pandemic level, but, you know, personally and internally felt difficult, I would always seek out a work partner somewhere, somehow that I could say, we kind of tried to stand each other up, right? So that we could keep marching forward. And I think you've done that, but to another level by developing the leadership within your team. And I'm, I'm beyond grateful for what you're doing for the individuals in the department for the support that's being shown to one another and then the outcomes that you're able to produce so just wanted to get on the record because it's been multiple years of challenge and um i'm looking forward to working with a commission and mayor that wants to continue to increase the resources that we know are so needed in order for public works to fulfill its mission of helping us build the city that we want. So commissioner Stites. What was that gentleman? What's your first name? Russ. 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 Congratulations on your promotion. Thank you, sir. That's all. Thank you very much. All right. So with that in mind, you have the next item, which I think we're circling back to item seven. And that is our conversation about right away maintenance and thank you all for, yeah. for your presentation. So you have a 
presentation on this as well. And Mr. Fisher, who's going to come? Is it Mr. Bellacci? Okay. Yes, ma'am, Mr. Bellacci. Thank you very much. <laughs> <clears throat> well, you might recall that um, we were in front of you in November to revisit right away mowing and um, we've been asked to do this again and so I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Bellacci for a few minutes let him highlight the, the past and the present and uh, and then we got a, a question for the, for the commission and then we'll just be prepared for wherever that discussion goes. All right Vince Bellacci manager of Street Vision. So as Jeff mentioned, uh, we kind of started this several years ago. We identified that our right-of-way maintenance program was not following the ordinance that was in place. So in 2017, we did an internal review of that, uh, got in line with the ordinance, with the commission, and we kind of slow rolled that out in 2018 with full implementation in 2019. And this is the ordinance here. I think the, without reading through it all, the, the key point is that it's unlawful for any property owner to allow excessive growth on their properties. Uh, we reached out to the next two slides or we reached out to other municipalities to see KCMO is kind of the most comparable with what they do as far as right away maintenance and having the staffing challenges, but we have Casey Mo, Roland Park, Prairie Village, and Leewood. They're all doing pretty much the same thing we're doing currently as far as mowing, uh, no tree trimming, and just kind of the down trees are placed at the property origin. So all, all of those communities are doing the same, and that's what we're doing as well. Uh, so the first bullet point there kind of points that out with what we're doing. The second one is we know there's always special cases uh, that come to us. And I think as a point of clarification, all of the ones that have been brought to us, we haven't denied anyone that brought a special case for, for mowing that we're aware of. Uh, getting into compliance with the ordinance and reducing the amount of private property mowing we were doing or eliminating that allowed us to focus more on street maintenance. And again, the PCI is continuing to decline, so that need is going to continue to rise. Uh, it's a focused and fair and equitable approach the way we're doing now. Uh, the community survey, the last four of those has had street maintenance as the top priority. So getting there, you know, no longer maintaining private property helps us with that. Uh, the question for you all is what changes, if any, would you like us to make for the right-of-way maintenance program? Commissioner King. I don't care if, if the Pope or anybody else, Leewood Prairie Village, we don't, I don't represent them. I represent District 5. And when you guys brought to the, this to us, it affected District 5 more than any other district that we have. Mr. Gronum lives off 123rd Street. Some of those houses, then you're going down 123rd Street. There's a senior citizen lady that lives there. there she, one, she doesn't have the funds. Two, she couldn't do it if she wanted, and it's still a mess. But let's ask you guys a question. Let's say your parents are in their late 60s, and they live off a of parallel, and they can't do anything. They, they might have the money to do it, but they don't know what to do because it's unsafe because the cars are going 45 miles an hour, right? Let's say a grandma, 91 years old, and she lives off of Pulver, and there's some deep and, and slotted spots where it's extremely unsafe that I pointed out in the first place that we should have done not, not made it where the people did the best they could and then call you guys to come do it. You have caused an uns in my mind, and I'm not speaking for any other commission, I'm speaking for me. I got multiple complaints nonstop about, it, and you guys, so what do you want? I want you to go back to what you used to do. And I know you're 19 people short. When I was at General Motors and Line was short, they put supervisors out there to perform that job. They put union reps out there to perform that job. The situation that you caused 
has affected my district and you do not answer those phone calls where the people are crying and say, I'm in trouble. And if it's been, it's frustrated me this whole time. And then the other day, one of you guys said, are you serious? I'm dead serious. We should not have to sit there and answer the phone to our senior citizens and, and say, I'm sorry, but that's what you have to do. And I don't like it. I never did like it. Commissioner Markley. Thanks. Um, we've obviously revisited this issue repeatedly. I think what is clear is that we're not all going to agree on this issue. I disagree with Commissioner Kane on this issue. I am comfortable with how we're handling it now. I appreciate that you have handled special cases because I do understand that there are those special cases. I've had them in my district as well. I appreciate how you've handled them. Um, but the reality is if these people lived in any other place in the metropolitan area, they would be taking care of their own right of way. And we have been taking care of it all these years and we've paid for it. Um, we can't afford to keep paying for it. And I'm comfortable with the changes we made previously and the way you guys have handled it. And I understand the commissioner Kane does not agree. We don't agree on this one. That's all right. One more thing I just wanna say, Commissioner Kane said, this is a problem you caused, but I just wanna be clear. It's a problem the commission caused because the majority of us voted for this change. And I understand Commissioner Kane did not vote for this change, but I just wanna be clear. That was us guys. If we're unhappy, we're the ones who made that vote, not Public Works. Other comments, questions? I think the, you know, uh, we, we, I didn't agree with that. I know, but I but we closed the fire station down in Fairfax. We had to reopen it, right? This, when I got here umpteen years ago, this is what we were doing. This was the past practice. So I'm going off past practice not current practice. And like I said, they don't have to answer the calls that I'm answering that are people upset. And, and some of them are, are not, they're, they're your age, Angela, but they don't have the equipment to perform the job. So I guess what I'm gonna do, I, well, I'm, I'm not, I'm nope, I'm not gonna say it. Any, other comments because our staff is is asking for uh, you know again input. Um, if I understand properly, the current situation. If we were to go back, and I asked you when we met, and and you have this map in the packet. Um, is it available to put on the screen? Actually, the presentation. I, I know it's not part of, of this presentation that you just gave, but am I correct that this map that you're showing us inside the packet is the mowing map that we talked about having access to? I don't have the full packet, so... I don't know. It's embedded inside the, the packet, the agenda packet, the published agenda packet that you all have. Um, it's on page. It looks like they're working to find that commissioner. And the only reason I'm asking, I, I don't mean to delay us. Page 46 of the 75 pages in our packet. While they're, while they're, while they're uh, looking, looking for that, I know Mr. Blatchy did some work to Thank you. quantify. That's, that's where I was headed. Consequences of this, right? So <laughs> I, I would say two things. I believe he can correct me if I'm wrong. If we wanted to go back to the way we were doing this uh, a few years ago, we're looking at around seven, $600,000 a year. That was that include new equipment? Yes. That includes new equipment that we would need because we never, we no longer carry that level of equipment since we went away from that practice. We'd have to buy new equipment and then the cost of mowing would be about 600,000. I think more importantly, 
as Mr. Blachi pointed out earlier, 2017 or 18, we scanned every city street segment in the county, and it was an average of 56. And we've talked a lot over the last few years about the PCI, the conditions of our streets. And we just did this again last year. And so our average in 17 or 18 was 56. Now it's 51. We're going in the wrong direction pretty fast now. Uh, and we've talked in our outcomes and strategies document that the commission adopted by resolution about a goal of supporting strategies to get from what was then 56 to 65. And that's millions of dollars. Remember the 20 plus million that we talked about repeatedly. So I'm suggesting is we can do, we can mow whatever the commission wants us to mow. Those are going to be the consequences. Vinny will essentially have to pull one of the pothole patch crews out of operation because uh, of the vacancies we have for a solid season. So the 28,000 potholes that he has been able to fill over the last each year for the last two years would go down significantly. And therefore, our, also our PCI would continue to deteriorate. So those are just the consequences of, of this. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my points and then I'll come back to you. In the, in the map that's in the packet that is on page 46, um, I think, Commissioner Kane, that map demonstrates your point, which is, um, let me just clarify, if I'm able, that the map that I'm looking at is actually the mowing map. That's the map. What I'm asking Public Works to clarify is the map that was put in this packet, is it the previous mowing map that I had requested when we met? Correct. Okay. Because there is a lot of red in the, in the Northwest quadrant. Um, there's a lot of red in a lot of other areas too, but whether they whether all of the tiny red segments in the more densely populated areas equals the long, the long strands of red, I don't know. I'm not good at those kinds of things, but um, so I'm gonna concede visually that you're right. It impacts your district in a way that strikes me as larger. Um, we talked about, is there a hybrid option available that maintains, for example, maybe this trouble list that you've created of the folks for whom it's difficult or physically not possible or the myriad of reasons that have been given when you've taken a call or we've possibly sent you a request to assist someone. Uh, you said that you didn't turn any of those folks down, which makes me think you have a list and you kind of know since 2019 full implementation where those biggest problem areas might be. Is that fair? Yeah, so, so once we get a request that once we deem that we should be doing that area or it's too dangerous for the resident to be doing that, that automatically gets added to our list. So it's not a recurring thing that they have to call every time it gets tall. Okay. We, we add that to our list. I, I, I think there could be a hybrid solution here. I'm deeply troubled. <sighs> by the $600,000 price tag of going back. I'm also troubled by the fact that if we go back, we are willfully violating our own ordinance, which makes no sense to me whatsoever. So if we were to go back, obviously an ordinance change would be in order, several apparently, um, and, and that's fine. You know, if that's the will of the, commission, then it just needs to be accompanied with the appropriate um, laws 
that go with that. And we'd have to work with legal for what that would be. Um, I think that we know there are some places that we've talked about that it just doesn't make sense. It's not practical. It doesn't make sense to ask that owner to handle that area uh, for whatever reason. We've heard what those areas are. Um, and again, they're probably already on your list. Um, maybe, maybe we map your list and we see what that looks like. Um, I heard you have some folks who like maps. So, um, you know, maybe we compare this map that's in our packet with a map that's created of the list. And I'm sorry, Jeff, you know, we're asking you to come back repeatedly to talk about this, but it's important in my mind. And it has financial consequences for the unified government, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and, and you've answered the question I asked you when we met, which was, if we do this, what are we not doing? Because now we're gonna go back and do this. And I think I heard $600,000 and fewer potholes and a continued deterioration of our pavement condition index. So that bothers me a lot, given again, as you know, uh, what the community survey tells us repeatedly and the additional support and resources and funding that we are trying as a commission so desperately to provide to your department because we have the, strategic plan that we worked on with you that identifies so clearly the extreme deficits existing in your department. I'm preaching to the choir in this room. Anybody else want to weigh in? Commissioner Kane, you made me, you let me talk, so I'll let you talk. Well, I think $600,000 is overinflated. And that uh, Fisher just said they don't have the equipment to do it anymore. So how do we ask the citizen to do it? You guys had the equipment and they don't. And as far as the list goes, if they have a list, I'm sure, and I, they may, may, I'm sure they do, but I shouldn't have to call them back and say, hey, Hubbard is a mess. Hollingsworth's a mess. You know, because one of the roads, the stuff was so bad, it was hitting the school buses on the top. And everyone knew it. And I had to get Alvy to go out there to say, yeah, I guess that's a little messed up. You know, so my, my, my frustration, this is, this, I've been frustrated since we changed it. And, and like I said, I think $600,000 is, is overinflated. I don't think it costs that much, you know, and, and that uh, I don't want somebody hurt. Well, I, I can agree with not wanting somebody hurt. I've got two commissioners, and I apologize, Stites and then Commissioner Merkley. So, uh, Commissioner Merkley, you have been here. I hear. So when we mow parks, like, the Wyandotte County Lake, Wyandotte County Park. Who who's mowing that? Is that county or is that city that's doing the mowing? And what equipment is that? Angel, is that county or city? My guess is city. But the city's mowing the county park. City. The city's mowing Wyandotte County Park. <laughs> So, um, so is there a possibility that maybe we look at some, cause I mean, I see them out, um, out at the legends area. Um, I've seen contract mowing being done and, uh, on that, the new 98th street between state and parallel, uh, there's a company that's mowing those medians. Who is that? The contract. Yeah, it's Come up to the, go ahead. Thank you. So first, let me also clarify on the last question. So we, uh, in our mowing funds, we do separate and identify how much we spend on like county parks. So we could probably break that out. Um, Commissioner Seitz, you're right. We do have a contractor that mows the medians. Um, that's not parks related. No, no, I, I no, uh, two separate. Okay. Two separate. So I, where I was going with that though, if, is if we have somebody contracted that's uh, mowing those medians, maybe that, 
we contract them with our troubled areas, your list, the reoccurring lists. I'm just throwing that out there. And maybe that's not to the tune of $600,000. Yeah, what we've discussed contract outsourcing work. Well, I don't believe Mr. Blotcher and I are saying we shouldn't do those trouble areas. We're doing those. We're saying if you want to do more than, than that, if you want to kind of sort of go back to old practice, uh, it's going to cost $600,000 a year. What we're currently doing um, we're, we were, we're able to manage that now with all the vacancies, as Commissioner Kane pointed out, regardless of what our, what our policy is, with all the vacancies over the last few years, not just public works, but I know Parks and Rec has struggled to stay on top of mowing. That's a separate, that's a separate problem. Um, if you have to call back two or three times to get somebody to mow something, it's simply because we just can't get there fast enough, right? Um, well, hence the reason I'm saying maybe some contract mowing until we get staffed so that we can address this problem until we um, get staffed enough that we can take it over and handle it. And so um, maybe that would be something that uh, that we might be able to, to look at there. Okay. Okay. Well, and I, and I like it. Like, Mr. Bynum, I mean, you pointed out, uh, Mr. Cooley sat right here and talked about data-driven and data. This is how we base what's going on. I think it's a, it would be important for just like what you said, show us show us those pro those problems on data-driven so we can look at it on paper um, and see where these problems are at and and if the, and how would somebody get on that list of problem um, that reoccurring problems that they. That don't have to be called two or three times. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Merkley and then Commissioner Ramirez. Thanks. I, I do. I just want to take a moment to say the vast majority of our residents are mowing their right of way, have been mowing their right of way, and we're mowing their right of way before we even started having this discussion. They've just always been doing it and didn't know there was any difference. Like we're all mowing our right of way, that little stretch along your sidewalk or along the front of your yard or the back of your yard. Um, so I just want to take a moment to recognize that because a lot of people may be watching this and going, well, what are we even talking about? I, I just mow my lawn, you know, I take care of it. And I think that's the majority of people. What we're really talking about are two situations. One is people who have legitimate concerns because of the way that their land is graded or the way their land is set up and they can't take care of it the same way that we can take care of an average lawn. The other group is the people who just don't give a crap and who are purposefully not taking care of their right of way. And so what we're trying to do is walk that line and say, we're not taking care of your land because you're lazy. You have to take care of it. That's what the ordinance says while still addressing those people who have legitimate issues. So I feel like those issues can be addressed through the list that's existing and the process that is existing. But I just wanted to recognize that a lot of people out there might be watching this and wondering what we're talking about because they've been doing this all along. And I thank them for that. And, and we appreciate that they're taking care of the property the way they should be. I appreciate the comment. Uh, Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, Commissioner Bynum. Um, rarely, again, am I stuck in the middle between what Commissioner Markley, but also Commissioner Kane. Um, I, I think what you were saying, Commissioner Bynum, is like we need a, a compromise. You know, like come find a middle somewhere of how can we continue to do what we're doing, but also be able to have the ability to help. And I, I really do like if we can look into it, uh, Commissioner Stice's idea of contracting out. And I would, because it's just only to up to the point where until we have the ability of a staff to do the job. Um, I, I like that happy medium. I don't know if... Um, Again, this, we don't have to decide that today. It's, it's, I feel it's going to continue to be an ongoing conversation, but um, may, I, may I follow up on that? Huh? Go ahead. First of all, I want to see the entire list of, of all the districts. List of the- Everywhere that-, that, that The problem areas. Right. Okay, go ahead. And then I want to see mine. Mm -hmm. And then we'll drive around and staff will not deem which one needs to be cut. 
I will deem which ones need to be cut because they don't seem to think the same way I do. So if you guys are willing to do that, and, it, and it'll take more than one trip, you know, we're gonna have to go around to the spots that, that I know are dangerous. But I'd like to see, and, and this goes into, I know Commissioner Marker disagrees with me, but I'll bet you, I've got a, I know I have at least five times as much issues as the other places do. And I just want to make sure my district's as safe as everyone else's. Yes. So let me see if I can put some guidance on what we're all saying. Because uh, I am hearing a lot of things. And, I'm, and I think it starts and ends with the list. Um, so you have a list <laughs> that you have compiled over the last multiple years of the... Um, decision to follow the ordinance, I'll call it. And we'd like to see that list. And I think we'd like to see it broken out by commission district and then maybe take some road trips. And for example, Commissioner Kane can identify for you, this one is more dangerous or challenging than this one. And, you know, each of us may know uh, a property in our district where we know it's dangerous or more challenging. And then we begin helping prioritize that way. So as part of the hybrid solution, I always have proposed another component of the hybrid solution is the, the, um, the main thoroughfares, Leavenworth Road, Parallel State Avenue, Metropolitan, you know, there are some some main thoroughfares that that I think deserve the attention of the mowing. Um, what I don't think I'm clear on yet is I know Pub Parks does certain mowing, but Public Works does certain mowing also regularly right now. Correct. Correct. Who mows the vacant? The land bank lots, the vacant lots, the tax delinquent lots, Spirit. the lots that are <laughs> angels. Parks is doing that. So somebody calls 311 because the vacant lot in their neighborhood is six feet tall. Parks does that. Okay. So Parks is mowing parks and all the vacant properties. And you are doing some of that with contractors, are you not? Correct. We are actually this year. We are um, putting more of the vacant lots out for contractors. You in in say it again. More vacant lots will be cut or fewer. Um, more will be going from our in-house crew that was mowing them to contracted. Okay, so we have a contractor list. There are contractors. What's Public Works mowing? Thank you. What's Public Works mowing? It's primarily right away city maintained areas, a few KDOT areas, but not many. Okay. We're not going to solve it tonight, but we've given you quite a good deal of feedback. All right. I do think we want the list. You know, both in some sort of street order, but also visually on a map. I do, I'm very visual and I like to see those things and where they are. I think it's fair for us to go look at them or we might be like, I know that one, that's Aunt Betty. You know, uh, I think it is important. So have we said enough to you to know something or do you- uh, I, I, I think so, we, we can develop the map and come back in April if I could ask because I think it'll, it could be important. I uh, just want to make sure I understand what you were suggesting, Commissioner Stites. Contract some workout that would help augment what we currently do so that we're able to stay on top of the current work better. Or are you also suggesting using contract to augment the old practice if we decide to go to the old practice? Well, I think what, uh, what I was hearing is you're saying right now at staffing levels where they're at that you are able to keep up with what you feel like may be different than what Mr. Kane feels like, 
you're 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 maintaining the complaints, right? So what I'm saying, if that list is larger, right, then I th then that you can't do that. Or if this list that gets identified is larger than your list that you've provided um, is something that you guys can't handle, okay. then we need to um, maybe look at how we would uh, contract that out. So it does, because at the end of the day, we don't want to, we don't want to add this whole list to you. Great. This larger list than you've already got and you not be able to perform. Right. right? That doesn't do anybody any good. Right. At the end of the day, we need those folks to be taken care of. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So I'm just trying to figure out a way that we get both things done. Okay. And then you, then as you get staffed fully, then we could take them over. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So here's what I'm hearing to recap. Again, um, sharing the current problem list, um, some, some contracting that I'm going to call a part of a hybrid solution, and then possibly some mowing of the main thoroughfares, and then continuing to, to mow what you already mow. Um, I miss something? Well, um main thoroughfares so a full commitment to main thoroughfares just my suggestion okay that's what i'm i'm well, including that as part of a hybrid yeah we can we, we can we can quantify and describe that for the next meeting somehow uh that would require an ordinance change of course so we'll we can maybe um we'll think about that but we can be ready for the april we'll see thing. if that is or is not going to require changes in the ordinance. Okay. It would. All right. Well, it's a good discussion. I appreciate it. Yeah, We've got thank to you. Do something. Appreciate it. I mean, we do need to do something. Um, and thank you. And we only have one more item on this agenda. And that is East-West Transit Corridor Study Update. Yay. And uh, Gunner Hand is here. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Commissioner Biden, Standing Committee. Uh, Gunner Hand, Director of Planning and Urban Design. Uh, tonight we have uh, some special guests from the consultant team working on the East-West Transit Study. I'll let them introduce themselves, but we have representations from the KCATA and the consultant team. Um, accordingly, um, this has been a, a culmination of a year-long planning study. Uh, unlike other, quote, plans, long-range plans that we put together, we are not asking for action tonight. This is for information only. Um, when you're working towards, it's a little different than like an area plan, right? But when you're working towards potentially creating a new transit line, there are many, many phases in that project. The first one is planning. Uh, what is the route? What is the mode? Uh, what are the goals? And then subsequent uh, phases from preliminary engineering to full design all the way to construction documentation are many, many phases thereafter. Um, so without uh, letting the cat out of the bag, I'll let them uh, announce what the recommendation is moving forward. It is tied to a separate agenda item um, on the Administrative Human Services Committee, which we'll get to at that moment. Um, but we would also ask um, if you all would like this presentation to also be given to the full Board of Commissioners. Um, we'd like to make that determination and have that conversation as well so we can schedule the team accordingly. Uh, with that, I will pass it off to Mr. A.J. Ferris with the Kansas City Transportation Authority. A.J., just real quickly. So if you would pull the microphone a little closer and just make sure that y'all, when you are talking, that you're talking directly into it because it can be really hard to hear even with the microphone. Thanks. Absolutely. Hopefully uh, this is an okay volume. Uh, I'm a pretty loud speaker naturally, but like Gunnar said, my name is A.J. Ferris. All right. <laughs> I figured you know, she asked me, I'd pull it forward. <laughs> I appreciate the honesty. Um, 
So uh, my name is AJ Ferris. I oversee the planning and scheduling departments at the Kansas City Area Transportation Authority. Uh, to my right, I have Robert Hozak with the h and consulting team and Alex Miller from the Parsons and Associates team. They'll be here to kind of help answer any questions that we have. So we are returning to you. We presented to uh, this committee in October. Uh, so in the interest of time and with your permission, I included a lot of stuff in the packet, and it's a lot of stuff that has already been presented to you. So with your permission, I will breeze through probably the first half of this presentation. Feel free to stop me at any time if you have points of clarification. Permission granted. Permission granted. Well, here we go. The Kansas City Area Transportation Authority, along with our project partners, uh, you know, Gunnar already talked about this, but basically identifying a high capacity, high frequency transit solution between the two anchor locations of the University of Kansas Health System and Truman Sports Complex. We are basically at the culmination of that project. This all information is in your packet, but was already presented to you. So we are going to go ahead and move on just to kind of give you an idea of the timeline. So the evalu evaluation criteria was developed through one-on-one -on -one, uh, and stakeholder engagement. This was then used to funnel into our tier one screening that was held in conjunction with micro meetings and our first round of public engagement, then transitioned and funneled down further into our two tier screening, which we will get into later in this presentation. We had our second round of public meetings to help us, uh, our help influence the work that was coming out of that tier two screening. And we will be showing you at the end of today a preliminary final recommended alternative. I wanna be clear, this is not a locally preferred alternative. There's still more work that will need to be done to get us there. Uh, a lot of public engagement has been done, as you can see in this, you can find this in your packet, but many survey responses um, and a lot of great information that really allowed us to move forward uh, with a strong emphasis on what does the public want this to look like. The main thing they want it to look like is to increase the number of goal, uh, people who use transit over driving. That was the number one thing that we heard from our evaluation criteria, that that was the most important evaluation criteria to the public. So this, oh, this was presented back to you in October, basically outlining everything that we started with. These were all the different alignments throughout the study area that we looked at. You can see we have alignments, uh, on 31st Street, Linwood, 35th Street, 39th Street, 43rd Street over in the, and Southwest Boulevard on the, and Rainbow on the Kansas City, Kansas side. No, on the Kansas City, Kansas side, we had 43rd Street, 39th Street, Southwest Boulevard and Rainbow alignments. <laughs> You're fine. Uh, through uh, public engagement in, the tier one screening, we entered into what you see here. It was basically funneled down to our, on the rainbow side, or excuse me, on the Kansas City, Kansas side, we had 39th Street determined. This was done not only through public engagement, where people said, this is what we want to see. This was communicated to us by project partners, including the University of Kansas Health System. And our great team to our right did a lot of fantastic evaluation work, truly understanding what we would get the best benefit from and what would be the most feasible for this project. So scenario one through this area, we look at the streetcar mode from KU Med Center going along 39th Street up Broadway or Main, and then across the north side of our study area with 31st and Linwood, and then terminating at the 31st and Van Brunt area. The exact termini of both the scenarios that you'll see tonight have not yet been identified because they require more planning work. As I'm sure you all know, this scenario comes with a very high ridership potential, but also a very high capital cost. You see uh, about $600 million in current year dollars uh, being required, but it does come with a greater economic development benefit. As I said, we stop at 31st and Van Brunt with this scenario because the land density and land use in that area just doesn't warrant a high capital cost that this would come with. This would be a high quality amenity, high capacity vehicles, and a very high frequency of service. Uh, finally, rail construction causes a very significant traffic and corridor disruption. You'll see on the right side of this slide that there, are, that there were ongoing considerations, specifically the conversation between 31st Street and Linwood on the Missouri side and Broadway and Main Street. 
So funding, there is the existing Kansas City, Missouri 3.8 cent sales tax. Uh, this would not, basically this is, would not be enough to cover co capital or operating costs unless we significantly reduce service throughout the rest of the region uh, on Kansas City Area Transportation Authority and other ride KC services. We have the Transportation Development District that we have been have looked into. Um, and as we'll see a little bit later, a similar East-West Transportation Development District would likely not yield enough to cover project costs because it is simply a lower density area than the current TDD along Maine through downtown Kansas City, Missouri. New transit funding, which would most likely be what we would be looking for, uh, is city, county, or regional funding initiatives. There could be private sector contribution, but this would be a dent, but an important dent that we would be made. It certainly would not be the largest portion of it, but something that we would wanna look into and have conversations about. Then we have the federal side of things, the capital invest investment grants, specifically the New Start grant, which is a uh, program that would typically cover about 50% of capital cost, with the rest coming from local match. And there are other federal grants for capital funding that would have uh, smaller amounts that we uh, have looked into. There's an estimation of about eight to 10 years total for this to be fully implemented and on the ground. Uh, we are in those yellow phases right now, of the three years of planning and project development. Uh, you have the two years of final design, about four years of construction, and then that gets you to the total of 10 years for implementation. So scenario two, uh, basically it's the same alignment, but we're now looking at a bus rapid transit solution, or basically what we call around the region, the MAX buses. So Prospect MAX, Truce MAX, uh, Main MAX. This would be a higher level than those. This would be a true bus rapid transit solution. Again, it's the exact same alignment, except for when we get over to the east side uh, at Truman Sports Complex, we could look at continuing this to actually create that connection. You'll see that the densities have not changed. It's the same. And so we probably wouldn't have the large investments of multiple stations, but with a rubber tire solution, we could make that connection a lot easier. A lot of the same things. Uh, it's a high ridership potential, not as high as we would think that would come with a streetcar solution. It is a lower cost compared to the streetcar, but there is also less of an impact for potential economic development throughout the, uh, throughout the study area. Same comments about East of Van Brunt, not having the density to merit a large capital investment. Uh, this also provides high capacity and high amenity transit service. Um, and a bus rapid transit construction has a far less, does not have as great of an impact that a streetcar or rail in the ground construction would have. Same ongoing considerations when looking at 31st Street versus Linwood and Main versus Broadway. Funding looks pretty much the exact same. Again, there's the existing 3.8 cents Kansas City, Missouri sales tax that could potentially be used. But again, if it was used for this, that would come at the cost of other uh, regional services. New transit funding is the same thing. The only difference here that I would highlight is instead of the new starts capital investment grant program, we would be targeting the small starts investment, capital investment grant program, which is basically just for projects that are under a certain threshold of dollars. Pretty much the same schedule, except for we're looking, we would be looking at an estimated seven years total for implementation. And now we get to probably what we want to talk about. This is our preliminary recommended alternative. Uh, this recommended alternative would basically go from the KU Medical Center down 39th Street, north up Main, uh, east across 31st Street, and uh, terminate at the 31st and Van Brunt area. Streetcar, we have been told by the public, is the aspirational goal. And so that is what we will continue moving forward with. Again, a locally preferred alternative has not been identified yet. And in the coming months and year, our work will be to refine and move forward to actually identifying that locally preferred alternative. The last thing is we have submitted a raise grant to continue that advanced planning and refining that locally preferred alternative and getting us ready for project development, NEPA work, and getting us into the capital investment grant new starts program. So hopefully I went through that at a pace that was acceptable. Uh, but if you want me to come back 
to any of the slides or cover something in more detail, I'd be happy to. Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, Commissioner Bynum. Um, I'm the commissioner that's right on Rosedale uh, KU Med. So this is, I know this very well. Um, I don't, I, and I know the majority of the part of word, the 39th majority of that's going to be in KC Mo. Not much in until you get to uh, KU Med, does it turn into my district in Wyandotte County? Mm. Um, I know 39th very, very well. It is not a very big street. Uh, there is a many, many businesses up and down 39th. And so it's, I was just, I was just curious as to why was 39th such a, the big street to focus on. Cause it's, it is a small street. They're uh, parking up and down 39th. And I feel if, buses or a streetcar comes in, that's get taken away. And then there's going to be more parking in the neighborhoods and a lot of neighborhood uh, residents aren't going to like, again, that's mostly Missouri, but I like to be a good partner on the other side. Absolutely. Um, and so, and as even when it comes through KU, having, that's my only, my only concern is the is KU. It's, ambulances are going through there and you're going to have public transportation coming in and out as well. Absolutely. And maybe a possibly streetcar. If, so that's, are... if that's the aspiration. And so that's, that's my only concern. When I first heard this, um, I drive, like I said, I drive down 39th a lot and it's, I try visioning either a bus or a streetcar going down that street. And it, it's, unless you want to adversely affect not only the small businesses, but also the neighborhoods around, it's the only way. So I'm curious of why was 39th such a big thing to had to be. So I'll answer part of that question and then I'll turn it over to uh, Bobby to kind of get more to the analytics between why 39th street. Um, the point that you made about uh, the businesses that are along 39th street is incredibly important. One of the next steps and one of the soon, very soon next steps is going to be engaging 39th Street, the, uh, the CID there, and basically understanding, you know, here's what we've done. We need to hear from you now. Because like we said, a locally preferred alternative has not been selected at this point. We have an aspirational, preliminary, preferred alternative. And, you know, it's one of the reasons why we're coming to groups like you. And one of the reasons why we need to now increase the amount of engagement we're doing with people that are now going to be more impacted because we know what we think we want to move forward with. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that you know and are not worried that our, one of our very next steps is to engage those businesses and make sure we understand what their concerns are and what their needs and desires are. Mm -hmm. So now I'll turn it over to uh, Bobby. Thanks, AJ. Um, so getting into the analytics, you know, like AJ noted, we did a very data-driven approach to get to these alternatives. And one of the big things around that was looking at um, ridership potential, you know, the presence of population, you know, the journey to work aspects. And one of the big draws that popped out of 39th Street is, one, it's already served by a, one of the ATA's you know, higher ridership routes. So it had that already built in ridership potential around it that kind of made our analysis gravitate towards it. And then there's that heavy draw coming from the east side of Kansas City, Missouri to KU Med for the service workers and, and other employment opportunities around that, that further drove us to 39th Street. And it was all of those detailed factors that made 39th rise to the top. Like AJ noted, we're just at that, you know, 100,000 foot planning level of, you know, figuring out, you know, what makes the most sense. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done, communicating with businesses, the engineering feasibility that will get at some of the concerns that you highlighted around parking and how this would actually work. Um, the interaction with the emergency aspects of KU Med, um, 
you know, we see transit systems interact with hospitals around the country, but making sure it's designed in a way that would work well and not interfere with those are all aspects that'll be built in going forward. Commissioner, I would just add, Gunnar Hand, Director Planner, resign. I would also just add, we have obviously worked closely with KU Med, and they fully understand that any transit enhancement, especially if it's a streetcar on 39th Street, will effectively be a turning of the whole campus towards 39th as their front door, which it currently does not really feel like. So they fully, I think, are prepared and in their master plan are working towards making 39th kind of like their front step and front door. So a lot of the stuff that they're doing in their expansion is already working towards making 39th more transit friendly, if you will, um, and, and a better look to the, to, the welcome, to the kind of gateway of not just their campus, but also the UG. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you. And I, I, I do, again, that's not my district. It's not my area. Um, but again, trying to be a good partner to my fellow city councilman who or city councilwoman, I don't know, I'm not sure who represents that district. Um, but for my side, on my side of the line, um, my my thing is just making sure it it whatever comes of it, it 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 fits with what the community wants. Yes, of course, uh, KU Med, you know, it's a, a, their number one, they're one of our number one job creators in our community, amazing to have it. But at the same time, I also wanna make sure that the community on both sides of the state line, KCK and in KCMO, um, that they like it as well, that their voices are heard as well. And it's not just KU Med and the businesses, but it's also the community as well. And I know you guys have done a lot of community engagement and I thank you for that. Um, so that, that, I think my concerns may be early, just because there's, there needs to be a lot of planning that needs to go on. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that just my concerns went out there, out in front in the beginning. Your concerns are absolutely valid and that's why we have the planning process. All the points that you've brought up are things that we'll have to take a look at as we go through preliminary engineering. And that's, you know, that's some of the next steps that we're getting into. On the public engagement side, I do want to, like you said that you're around the Rosedale neighborhood. Um, one of the best public engagement events I've been to uh, in a long time, Alex did a great job, but the community in general, um, it was during that freak snowstorm that happened during February and that community still turned up and it was one of the most active and best represented public engagement events that I have seen a traditional public engagement event in a very long time. So to that community and the others that showed up, thank you. I, yeah, I will say Rosedalians, if, if they say they will go, they will go. <laughs> Come rain or shine, they will go. <laughs> I just a couple of comments. Um, the streetcar in Kansas City, Missouri, as it exists now, is funded through those um, specialized taxes. Is it a TDD? So, and they have voted now for multiple of them for the first phase and now the extensions, correct, to the north and the south. And those are funding the construction and maintenance of the streetcars in Missouri. Okay, I wanna make sure I was right about that. The 38 cent sales tax in, collected in Kansas City, Missouri is not funding the streetcar. Okay, it scares me to talk about using that tax to fund any part of this, unless we are talking about bus rapid transit. Um, but it sounds like since the streetcar is preferred, that you feel like your, your walking orders are continue to pursue streetcar, which I love, I love the streetcar. Um, but I would think that the funding mechanism would be would be similar, right? With your combination of federal, any state dollars that could be obtained, um, and and local through a TDD. And Commissioner Ramirez is rightly pointing out that, like, one percent of this entire proposed line is in Kansas. And I'm just, I might be getting way ahead of myself, but I'm wondering 
for that portion that's in Kansas, is it, could we contemplate a hospital district streetcar tax that's only the Kansas portion, similar to maybe the TDD that could be pursued on the Missouri side? And Gunner, maybe I'm just like way ahead of of this, but I mean, I'm just saying the streetcar is inordinately expensive, like one of the most expensive infrastructure projects that could be taken on. Okay. Gunnar Hand, Director of Planning and Design. Um, at this stage in the planning process, the funding that was noticed in the plan and referenced in the presentation is basically all we did. We pointed to a bunch of different sources and say, this is where it could be. Phase two, we'll get a little bit deeper into that, but based on what we do know, what we have discussed, what we have studied, yes, we have been looking at a TDD in um, Kansas, which is allowed by state law. They're a little bit different, pretty much the same thing, but a little bit different in Kansas than they are in Missouri, so we have to figure all that kind of stuff out. But I think no one's leaning towards anything because it's just not a part of the conversation yet, but that has been a part of the conversation, yes. Thank you very much. And if I could add just, um, we'll be coming to our interim steps. So we have probably about a year of time between since we uh, submitted our raise grant application and potential uh, awarding of those funds. Planning work isn't stopping in that time. We're still moving forward. And kind of that phase 1.5 is that what I'm calling it, will be coming to groups like you and uh, mm -hmm. all of our partners, whether they be municipalities or private agencies and starting to have those discussions of what does funding look like? What could it look like? So that's that's coming up. So uh, okay. look for an email from me. So I think that future discussions um, could and should probably include the um, benefit that's derived when a streetcar line goes in, like what Kansas City, Missouri has experienced you know, definitely the return on whatever investment is made. But anyway, I, again, Gunner knows I like to go straight to the tactics and forget all the planning. So um, uh, any other company? Yes, go ahead. Do either of you know by any chance who the council person is that? Uh, Bunch. Bunch. Is it Bunch? Oh, okay. who's the at large? Bunch, yeah, it's Bunch is, uh, in, is at large or yeah, he's he's in district and then Catherine Shields is at large. Oh, and she's the at large. Two. Yes. Okay. I would. I was just asking because I might want to yeah. reach out to them and have a conversation about it. It's a good idea. Okay. Anything else, Commissioner? If I may, under the under your tutelage at the KCATA, I think anything that would help advance uh, right. the study uh, would be much appreciated. Well, again, that's why I'm. That's why you talk about a three eight cent sales tax, and you make me very nervous. So maybe take that out of the presentation. Okay. Um, <laughs> anything else? Thank you very much. All right. If I'm not mistaken, that's the end of our meeting. And and will we see you again in the next meeting, or just next time you happen to come see us? Uh, no, they're done. You'll no, see me. Okay. You'll see me. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here tonight. I do appreciate it. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you. That concludes public works and safety. I would uh, take a motion to adjourn. Mark, we move to adjourn. Could I have roll call on the adjournment, please? Roll call. Groneman? Aye. Kane? Markley? Aye. Reitz? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Bynum? Aye. The vote is six to zero. Mr. Groneman, as always, thank you very much. <laughs> it's a good meeting. Interesting meeting. I will turn this over to Commissioner Markley for Administration and Human Services. Thank you. All right, team. Round two. Here we go. Before I call this meeting to order, I want to announce that some committee members, staff, and public are attending remotely via Zoom as well as on site. All participants joining by phone should mute their phones when not speaking to avoid background noise. During the meeting, please make sure you announce yourself by name and title every time you speak so the public that is observing knows who is speaking. When speaking, be sure and speak directly into a microphone so that all comments are heard and the record of the meeting is accurate. This is critical given the number of remote participants and is current guidance from the Kansas Attorney General. <laughs> 
just yawned. The public is allowed to participate by Zoom or submit comments by email prior to the meeting, and those comments will be included in the record of the meeting. The public may also indicate their intent to provide remote public comment by contacting the clerk's office by 5 p.m. the Thursday before the meeting. The public also will have an opportunity to provide brief comments either by telephone or via Zoom from the fifth floor conference room of the municipal office building. I will now call this meeting of the Administration and Human Services Standing Committee to order. Would the clerk please call the roll? Roll call, Kane. Kane. Roll call. Here. <laughs> Johnson, we have an absence memo. Ramirez? Here. Bynum? Here. Markley? Here. Stites? There are no revisions to the agenda tonight, and there are no minutes to approve, so we'll jump straight to our first item, which is acceptance of the Extension to Senior Care Act grant. And I think Desiree Bush is here to present. And this item does need to be fast-tracked. I will preview that for everyone. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Desiree Bush. I'm the fiscal manager at Area Agency on Aging and the acting director of the transit department. So we're in two hats. Uh, we'll go ahead and bring, bring up our PowerPoint. It's okay. I could go ahead and move forward. Don't worry about it. Um, if you find it, that's fine. But I, I have the PowerPoint on my phone. Are you all okay with that? Okay, it's short and sweet. Um, so we received senior care at dollars from the Kansas Department of Asian and Disability Services. And this is an ongoing grant for us. But this year, we received additional grant funds in the amount of roughly $62,000. Um, this is a one-time grant funding, and we are asking for the acceptance of an extension to our Sierra Care Act uh, grant funds or award. So the grant will expire June 30th. Again, we received an additional 62000 And uh, the great thing about this grant, there is no match. So no match at all. Um, the eligible uses of this grant is a one-time retention bonus for our staff employees, payroll expenses, um, incentive pay, onboarding, and staff training, and staff development. So we are proposing, uh, we meaning the Area Agency on Aging Department, we are proposing a budget of $22,100 for our staff bonuses of roughly uh, for 17 employees. Then also healthcare providers, uh, new staff, we are proposing a budget of $24,000 to hire 60 additional new staff or in-home providers. Now we do partner with six in-home providers. So that's given each provider roughly um, 10 new employees. And the sign-on bonus for the new employees is $400. Um, our in-home providers, they do provide in-home care for our senior citizens, meaning uh, attending care or homemaker services. Uh, so attendant care means that someone may be bed bound and they may, may need some assistance with changing their depends or they may have bed sores or what have you. So we have uh, care workers that care for them and then homemaker services. That's for if someone needs um, laundry assistance, if someone someone will go into the home and cook for them or uh, go to the store and shop for the for the client as well. Um, in addition, we are proposing $9,000 for our healthcare providers to help them market um, the new hires. So nowadays, most folks apply to uh, the jobs on Indeed or LinkedIn. So we're giving them a $1,500 uh, budget for each agency against six, six agencies um, to advertise for new hires. And then lastly, we have a budget of roughly $7,400 that will go towards our 
uh, healthcare providers for cleaning supplies, which will assist with the homemaker services. So that gives us a total budget of uh, 62,000, to be exact, $62,567.33. Questions from any <laughs> questions from any committee members? Did you want this fast track? It does need to be fast tracked. Yes. Fast -tracked. So I can't bind them. I have a motion and a second. Did I have any comments from the public, or is there anyone with hands raised uh, online? I no just, comments were received. No hands raised. I do have a hand raised from Mr. I just, I just want to say thank you for for what the department does. And um, I think that one thing that I don't think I understood clearly until recently is the, the in-home providers and the outreach that you have. That may not be the correct word, but I think you are serving a significant number of older adults in the community through those in-home providers. Is that right? Absolutely. It's one of our most popular programs, the Senior Care Act program. Actually, we receive roughly $780,000 uh, in grant funds. But if we were to um, eliminate a waiting list, it would be a total cost of $1.5 million to run that program successfully. So you still have a waiting list? Yes, we do. Okay. Any guesstimate of how many on it? I can I give that number today? Okay, so I, I can look that up for you. But what you what you propose here with your additional funds could, with being able to add more providers, could bring that down. Is that right? I don't want to like get too far out of line with what could happen. Not exactly. We are able to hire additional staff. However, the program component of of the grants is still limited okay yeah well i i, I want to thank you all for everybody in the department for what you do absolutely and i think there's a motion in a second we have a motion in a second roll call please roll call kane aye. stites aye. ramirez aye Bynum. aye markley aye the vote is five to zero Thanks very much. And, and Ms. Bush, also thank you for wearing two hats. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you. Have a good evening. All right. Item number two, team, is our update on short-term rental uses. Uh, I believe this is for information only this evening. That's why it's labeled an update. And Gunnar Hand is here to present. Welcome back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Gunnar Hand, Director of Planning and Urban Design. Um, we had prepared a presentation for you this evening, but at the Planning Commission hearing earlier this month, the Planning Commission directed staff to add something back into the ordinance. Um, and as a part of that, they've actually called a special subcommittee meeting next week by the chairman of the planning commission to go through some of it in more detail. Effectively, we had gone in, We've, if you recall, we've been through three iterations now. We've gone in uh, originally with the proposal to have a special use uh, permit process and an administrative process, which we do not have currently for short-term rentals. They did not like that, so we pulled it out, changed it, came back. They actually wanted it to put it back in, but at a more constrained level. So we're in the process of adding an administrative review in addition to just the regular um, special use permit process that we currently have, but has not been codified in our code of ordinances. Our anticipation is after, the, after all the engagement we've done, which we've described and presented in the past, after this special committee hearing, this well, technically next month, then the planning commission in April, we hope to be back here in April with a um, final ordinance for your consideration to the board of commissioners at that time. We are very, 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 very close on this one. <laughs> Commissioner Ramirez. Can I ask questions on the yeah, sure. <laughs> ordinance that's of course. in the packet? Um, for because I, I see here, and you might have to walk me through this. So <clears throat> part of it was the any of the following primary residential buildings, which would be allowed for an STR. And one of its mixed multifamily. Mm -hmm. Would that include apartments? Correct. So how would someone turn an apartment into an STR, would they have to get permission from the landlord, the property manager? 
Um, effectively, yes, but if you think about it, there are many apartments that are wholly owned by someone who then rents them out. So those people could turn a rental multifamily building into a series of short-term rentals and probably make a ton more money off it if they so choose based on our current process. So they would need one SUP to do that. So what we've done is based on other input that we've received from the public and some of the research we've done across the region and the nation is um, to a degree, we're actually probably more advanced than most in looking at this. We wanted to make sure that this short-term rental not only codified our current SUP process, but also addressed all the possibilities of a short-term rental. Um, we focus heavily on single family homes because that's pretty much all we've seen. We've seen a mixed use building that has asked one for the ground floor and the top floor. We've seen a mixed use building that has retail on the bottom with one on the second story. So there's been some other than single family homes. We just wanted to make sure that they uh, covered the gamut of all typologies so that all our bases were covered moving forward with this ordinance. And we had something to go off of that includes allowing some apartment buildings to move towards short-term rentals, but limiting that to no more than we had to pick based on the feedback we've heard. I think we've limited it to, it goes by unit numbers, as you can see in the ordinance, mm -hmm. but at some point it has to be less than half with the idea being it's not the majority of a unit, a block, a, uh, unless it's a single family unit, a building being all short-term rentals. Yeah. It says for for a building with seven dwelling units or greater, less than 50% of all total units are allowed to be short-term rental units. And again, because it is a special use permit process, what that allows us to do is it sets a maximum. That doesn't mean that's what they get. Because it's a SUP, special use permit, you, we can define however many maximum or little that we want on a case-by-case -case basis. But if we don't talk about how short-term rentals could be used in multifamily buildings, that will eventually happen and we will have a code that needs to be rewritten. So we tried to cover all our bases and move it forward, but also maintain flexibility for the future. Okay. That just You picked out the most esoteric piece of the ordinance. So good, good work. <laughs> Sorry. Good work. <laughs> Sorry. Es 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 Sorry. Esoteric, like only a planner would know how to talk to that jargon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I was reading through that and I read multifamily. I was like, wait, yeah, it's that's apartments. That's, yeah, that's where, it, yeah, that's where it gets a little, a uh, little, little tricky. Okay, I I'm still curious about that one. I'm on still on the fence. I don't know if I would agree with that or not, but I think I got to think more about it first. Um, the other thing was part of it was a new requirement was the of keeping a guest book, and then also. The responsiveness to neighborhood neighbor complaints. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there and you name out in the ordinance how different ways that we could get that data from. But could there also be on the other side, like a response book that the owner, occupier, whoever owns that STR would have to maintain also on their records? Like a log? A log of the response calls. Sure. We didn't think about that. I can add that to uh, the list. Yeah, we could get it from our KCKPD, we could get it from neighbors or in 311, but I think it's to be more accountable if you're getting, a, if an STR is having a service call on their property, they should also be more accountable and responsible and be the one to document it as well. Um, that was one thing I, I was going through and I thought of. And then the last one, I know that in this ordinance, it was based on the density, the new density requirement of no more than no more than one STR on each block. And, the, and I know it says in here that the current STRs will be grandfathered in, um, but I don't know if that will change with what the planning commission would like. Our, uh, our hand director planning design, I think the way we wrote the ordinance was so that if you all or the planning commission or others did not want to move forward with a bonus, uh, not bonus, a, a density maximum, what we currently have it as is one short-term rental per block. Yeah. And a block is defined as either side of the street between two streets loosely. With, obviously, we recognize that some streets are long and I have lots of curves and so on and so forth, but we, we define that, I think, appropriately. 
But with that understanding, we wrote it so that it was just one section of the code. And if, and if, if you all or the planning commission didn't agree with that density bonus, then they could literally just strike it out with the motion. The rest of the ordinance is left there as is. Okay. Um, and, I, and I will say is I, I like, I, I like the density bonus, yeah. especially because my district it's along with mine and I can't, I don't remember the Northeast who has a lot or uh, strawberry Hill who has the most concentration of mm -hmm. STRs. Um, so I do like, cause I know, Aaron Stryka with RDA, her, we've had conversations and I agree of having a, a density bonus requirement, not so many, to, so that doesn't take away the, from the character of the neighborhood. Um, I have no problem with STRs. They, they help the local economy, uh, economy, but also it's just we need to keep that nature and character of the neighborhood. And I, so I do like that. Okay. Um, and so it's the grandfathering in of the, old S, of the other STRs. I, it's, we would be... Uh, I feel like Rosedale would use a lot, would lose a lot of STRs if we didn't allow that grandfathered in. There are surprisingly not a lot of blocks in Rosedale that have more than one short-term rental, but really? it is getting to the point where it's almost every other block. Oh, okay. um, and so I just think the sheer number in a large geographic area is the concern because there is typically one or two every month that's coming in. And so there's a regularity to it that I think um, is not equal to the actual number of short-term rentals. But again, I think we chose, staff chose one per block because quite frankly, it felt like the easiest to enforce and it was the most tenable to manage. There's a Baker's dozen other ways you could limit density of these things. Um, those get more and more complicated. Okay. Um, the, my last question doesn't pertain to the ordinance. It's still the conversation. Um, and it's in your presentation. And I know we've, we're amazed. I know Commissioner Bynum was as well of how many, STRs are actually registered with us uh, as a SUP. What, um, what plans do we have to bring those STRs that are not into compliance into compliance with um, this new ordinance? So staff believes that having an ordinance, first and foremost, I think will... Um, bring in more applications. There are people who want to do this as a business who are actively looking for it and want to be following the rules. Um, right now, because it's not an ordinance, people don't know that there are rules. And so we catch the good actors and maybe not the bad actors, but everybody in between gets lost in the shuffle as well because they probably thought, well, I can just go to the platform and do it, right? And so as noted in the presentation, I think we did our current count about a month or two ago. And it's Pretty, it's hold, it's held on average about the same number, at least in my last three years here, which is, you know, we have about a hundred that are not permitted out there um, with a special use permit. So we think some of those will come in, but certainly not all of those. And so the rest of it becomes an enforcement action, which is a battle between manpower and uh, the ability to do it. We've created a couple new tools. Um, we created a door hanger so that if we see a short-term rental, or if we get reported a short-term rental and go to the platform and see it, that's basically how we, how we confirm, is it on a platform or not? Then we can run out there and put a door hanger immediately. And so we try to do something with some more immediacy, but at the end of the day, um, it does come down to balancing out yeah. of limited resources. So I think what we'll try to do with now two zoning enforcement officers, um, and you may have seen planning urban design department do this as past ordinances get adopted streets for people is a great example right we pass an ordinance and we immediately follow up with a bunch of uh, engagement outreach um, and in this in some cases this one included we'll probably do some um, zoning blitz okay special special focus on this specific issue if and when the short-term rental ordinance passes to kind of have that big first push of people to come in and apply essentially. Okay. Uh, no, I, I, I appreciate that. And I um, would like us to do that because it's sure the, the statistic of only 29% of our STRs are recorded with us only 29%. That's it's a very, very low number. And so I would like us to get as close as to hundred as possible, 
I know there's going to be those ones that are stragglers that don't, we can't find, or we just, they won't come in. But hopefully again, if we, when, if, and when we do put the ordinance in, um, it gives your department more teeth, more ability to enforce the rules. Um, so I, I do thank you for going through this. I know this is something that my district is very big on. This is a, a big issue for them. And so I thank you for listening to them, uh, taking in their comments and trying to work with them as best as you can. I, I really do appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. Commissioner Bynum. Thanks. Gunnar, just a couple of very quick um, corrections for the documentation within the application. Um, you've got an electronic document review user guide that has a contact list and um, a couple of super quick corrections would be livable neighborhoods is no longer Andrea Genero. They have a new director and then USD 500 has a permanent superintendent and the previous interim is still listed in that. So yeah. just a couple of um, very simple contact updates. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Stites. Gunnar, whenever you said um, you can check out on uh, different platforms to find out if they're on there. And are we talking like VRBO or, or those types of sites, right? Correct. I assume that's what you're referring to. So with each of these, um, TGT dollars should be applied, right? I'm sorry. Or transient guest tax. Uh, yes. So who will be monitoring to make sure that TGD, T, TGT dollars are being paid into and that we receive that percentage, which I think it's right now 9%. And then also um, a short-term rental would be defined as how, how long could they do it for one night? Is a short-term rental for one night? Um, short-term rentals are anything from one to 29 days. Right. So my concern with this would be that we have a, an apartment complex that can now rent a room for a night out. Right. And just, and it just, so then why are we not just sending them to a hotel? I mean, th those options are out there right now. Right. Again, uh, we haven't seen one like that before. If that were to come forward, it would still have to go through the public process with special use permit. And we don't necessarily have to give it to them, I suppose, if you all don't deem not to. So um, I think that we're starting to see other municipalities have this go beyond just single family homes and or condos. And we wanted to make sure that we had all of our bases covered. So I don't think we try to put any um, uh, preference on the typology. I think what we had heard consistently is we don't want these things to dominate our neighborhood. And so the right cutoff for us when we go beyond two, three, four, five unit accomplices was just to say the easiest, most tenable and enforceable thing, manageable, I would say, thing for staff would be to just say less than half needs to be. And that's the maximum. That, does, that doesn't, there, if I'm remembering the ordinance correctly, which I think I am, there is no administrative review for that type of short-term rental. You have to get an SUP. Okay. And I'll, I'll double check that statement. So regarding the TGT. Sorry, regarding the TGT, um, it's Kansas state law that any, any platform that has a revenue over, I can't remember, I think it's like a hundred thousand bucks. So it's a pretty low bar um, uh, has to, um, take those taxes in on the platform, they go to the state and then they get sent back down to local municipalities. I don't think anybody in finance knows where, what piece of that is from one versus the other, a short-term rental versus just a regular guest tax. I think we get a lump sum is how I understand it. But yes, we are collecting those. We are supposed to be collecting those transient guest taxes for platforms over $100,000, which we think is all of them. Mm -hmm. I think the, the big thing that we really need to look out for just kind of projecting out past short-term rentals is we're starting to see platforms where people are like renting out their garage to have other people store stuff in it or renting out their pool to have a pool party for a day. There's all kinds of things out there now in the um, 
now that the platform has introduced the idea, it's it's proliferating across all kinds of different ways to let people use a piece of your land, property, or otherwise. So that's where I think it's getting really complicated. It's going to get really complicated. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, this was again for information only, and we will have another visit from uh, Mr. Hand, I'm sure, to address that particular item. Our next item, item number three, is 2023 Interdepartmental Working Group Priority Project List. And I think Mr. Hand is addressing that one as well. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Gunnar Hand, Director of Planning and Design. I'd look to the audience. And what is left is your interdepartmental working group. Um, so uh, while they're pulling up the presentation, uh, it's a brief presentation. It basically, you've seen it in your packet. Um, so it won't take very long. But just as a background, I think in, in 2022, we had a couple of federal uh, bills get passed. Lots of new federal dollars come down the pike. Um, it was exciting times, right? Everybody in the UG was trying to pursue grants that were coming out, which felt like every other day, right? Um, and what happened was over the course of 2022, the departments who joined in this effort, which is, I hope I have them all, planning and urban design, economic development, community development, public works, public health, fire, finance, and BPU, all sort of started seeing one another pursuing kind of either the same grants or talking about the same grants for different projects or really just kind of bumping into one another in 2022 as we all as we all chased grant dollars. We had some success and we'll get to that in the next agenda item. We had some success doing that, but I think we all recognized that we could do better because the name of the game should not be chasing grants. It should be finding the right grant to fit your prioritized project. So what's before you in 2023 uh, in 2023 is we all came together to put together this list, not too dissimilar from, if you recall last spring, there was a list of projects that the UG sort of pre-approved for staff to go um, seek federal funding for. That's basically what this is. This does not preclude any other department or any of these departments from pursuing other grants. This is just sort of like the infrastructure heavy list that we all came up with based on some, a lot of them are existing projects that we didn't win last year. So we're kind of re-upping re on those. All of them are in existing long range planning documents and or have been identified by the board of commissioners um, in the budget, in the CMIP, somewhere else. We're not pulling this stuff from thin air. This is just sort of what do we know is gonna come out this year? What have long range plans prioritized? What have we been hearing from the community? And let's try to get that down to a list so it's a manageable thing that we can all move forward with. Um, so we focused it down to, if you want to click through, oh, that's me, click through, sorry. So that's basically what this slide tells us is we all kind of came together. Um, you heard me say this during, uh, the approval process for the, uh, GoDOT countywide mobility strategy. The UG has nothing but shovel worthy projects. We are trying to get to shovel ready projects. So all of these things are working towards getting shovel ready except for one or two, specifically the mega infra grant that you guys already heard at a previous meeting uh, of the standing committee. Um, so I have a list of the A through K projects that we're looking at. Again, it went through a multi-pronged effort to get down to this list from the plethora of ideas uh, that we had in other pursuits. Um, there are two grants, excuse me, two projects on this list that are effectively asking for retroactive approval for um, submission of grants. One is Project A, um, the Levy Betterment Project. This is the base grant that we did not receive from the state um, Department of Commerce last year for funding gaps in the Levy Betterments, trails namely, um, Levy Trails namely. It was resubmitted for us in the second round once the base grant program announced its second round. Those actually got submitted in January. So that one's in. We would still appreciate, we're still looking for retroactive um, permission to go after that grant. The second one you just heard um, in your previous meeting is the East West Transit Study. So phase two of that, the next round of planning, preliminary engineering, um, project development. Um, was submitted as a raise two. So it's the second year of the raise grants this year in 2023 um, was submitted at the end of February. Other than that, you have a match of, again, I think 
Most of these are um, projects where all the departments are collaborating. Some of them are more specific or primed for others, but we have Fires Training Center on there. We have the Northeast KCK Heritage Trail on there. Um, we have everything from uh, fleet electrification and weatherization program funding to put something together in partnership with BPU, um, which were two of their large priorities, um, to trying to find some additional funding for um, a landlord risk mitigation fund, which is basically a pocket of money that encourages um, uh, property managers to accept um, subsidized housing vouchers. It's a one tool we've seen other jurisdictions use as a mechanism to, um, to get that funding. Now, during the pandemic, those were people wanted to find Section 8 vouchers because those were guaranteed dollars um, when not everybody was guaranteeing dollars. Um, it's quickly shifted back to not a lot of folks wanting to have formerly Section 8 vouchers um, in their district. So that's just one tool that we saw as a, one to get towards the housing crisis. So it, it varies, right? There's some infrastructure, there's some housing, there's some, there's some programmatic stuff but it's mostly hard infrastructure um, getting shovel ready projects. And we are here to discuss any of the projects in detail if you so choose. Um, with that, I'll just stop. There's, a, there's kind of a information for each one in your packet so we can flip to those if we have individual questions. Otherwise, I'm not gonna go through the rest of the presentation. I'll stop at the map, how about that? Commissioner Bynum. So the back one slide, Sorry. Is Project G, which is funded, correct? Yeah, the number one before Mr. Hurst left and before him, before Justice, Mr. Welker left, um, the public trans, and I forgot to list them on the project, so I apologize, Ms. Bush. Um, uh, they are also a part of the, of the project inter departmental project okay. team. Their number one priority was to secure permanent funding for those two districts. So, so they're grant funded right now, but only for another year or two got it. each. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Kane, has anybody looked at Project J? <laughs> Just want to make sure you looked at it because it might bite you. So, thanks for putting that on there. I heard somebody wants to build a park in the in the fifth district. So, <laughs> Gunner, your wife's here. <laughs> Commissioner Ramirez, did you have something? Yeah, thank you, uh, Commissioner Markley, for the landlord risk mitigation fund. Is that kind of because I know. Community development has come before us talking about it. it um, I blanked on what this called um, source of income uh, discrimination bans. Is this a way to, I guess, incentivize landlords to take them? I see. I see the head shaking. I was going to say I'll look to Miss Stoffer to to answer that yeah. question, but the short answer is yes. That's exactly it, and it's directly from community development. Okay. Um, I think that's good. For us, uh, I've been a big proponent of instituting source of income discrimination bans. Um, I haven't had a conversation with Mayor Gardner about it. I know I had a conversation with the previous mayor, Mayor Alvey, um, but I'm still in support of it, and I still think we should have it on. We should still pass one. Um, but I think I, I like that we're looking at a different way and in incentivizing our landlords to, to accept vouchers. Because again, you could have the perfect rental history, nothing wrong with who you are. You can move in, but a landlord could just tell you no just because you have a federal voucher. Um, Technically, that's illegal, but yes, that happens all the time. Is that illegal? Yes, that's housing discrimination. It's against federal law. Hmm. Did not know that. Oh, sorry, something in my eye. <laughs> But um, so thank you for that. Thank you for including. Um, that's something I have near and dear to my heart. So thank you. I would just note that um, in 2022, one of the things I forgot to mention is that's the same year that we hired for the first time a grants manager and then lost that grants manager. Um, 
So we've been working with finance specifically. I also forgot to specifically name out our um, our grants, uh, not our grants coordinator, but our on-call grants um, consultant, um, iParametrics. And we have Miss Erica Carter here as well, who's been helping all of us do all of these things, um, as well as tracking grants and everything like that. So that's been invaluable in the absence of a grants coordinator. Um, but I know that um, our interim CFO is looking to hire a new one when, as soon as possible. So we will be back in 2024, and we hope to continue to come back on a regular basis and uh, keep doing this coordination work. Commissioner Bynum. So we've had a lot of conversations about Again, um, public infrastructure like our police and fire stations. And we've had a lot of conversations at the commission level about, for example, and I'm just using them as an example, the fire department, having access to grants that are available for what I would call bricks and mortar, but many other things, equipment, training, personnel. So through Homeland Security, other uh, federal departments. So is anybody on the team working on that part of it, the public safety part? I mean, I know the police department, just like they were in front of us tonight, they're writing grants. They know where the grants are that they qualify for and are going to receive. They bring those to us. We say yes. But what about specifically fire? Uh, again, this list doesn't preclude any other efforts by departments to pursue other grants. The one collaborative project on this list with FIRE is that large training facility uh -huh. that we pursued last uh -huh. year unsuccessfully with, if you remember, okay. we brought the community college in. It was a big effort. And we're going to pursue that again? Correct. It looks like, okay. But is anybody in the group, is FIRE active? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I guess it's a two-part question. Is FIRE actively pursuing grants? And if not, or are you actively participating with this group to identify and pursue grants? Thank you. Yeah, uh, we are actively working with the group to pursue the grants for it. And we're looking for grants. Technically, right now, there isn't uh, any uh, grants that we've identified that we could go after, but there's... Uh, an EDA grant coming down the pipeline that we're going to be looking at going after. So we're just kind of waiting for that to come out so we can do a little bit more research and develop our plan. And the EDA grant is the big $100 million tra technical training? Yeah, the, the notice of funding opportunity hasn't come out for that yet. We anticipate it'll be a big one. Okay. Does that answer your question? It or? does. I just wanted to make sure that you were at the table because yeah. we've oh, had this conversation at our level so many times with the notion that maybe grant dollars for you all are being left, left on the table and not pursued. So, okay, I'm sorry. Commissioner Kane. Commissioner Kane. That's exactly what they've done. And I'm not saying what he's talking about on this stuff here, but on equipment. We could have uh, got all brand new equipment for station uh, 12. We could have had the wages paid for a certain amount of time. And they refused to go, uh, management staff refused to go after those grants. And uh, in fact, remember, I was on the phone with the lady that, that said they were going to pay him. And then uh, the former administrator said he talked to her and she didn't know what she was talking about. No, she knew exactly. We were going to get however many man people it was going to be persons out there with equipment and, and the fire department refused to do it and said that, that it would have messed up their re original request for more uh, people power. And, and that was a lie. I want to say it again. That was a lie. I'm just asking that we make sure because we feel like we've had these missed opportunities that we, and with the, how badly we need the that particular kind of infrastructure that we make sure fires actively engaged. Yeah, we appreciate that. In addition, outside this group, we're we're also seeking um, FEMA's AFG grant for both staffing and for an apparatus. Cool. Okay. So we're we're trying we're trying to do different avenues as well. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you guys. I appreciate it. I would just add, you know, 
it seems pretty straightforward, but even just pulling the many departments together to have the focused conversation, I think has created a lot of realignment uh, in pursuits. Um, we're sharing more information than we were in the past. Um, I'm certainly reading more NOFOs, notices of funding opportunities than I would like, um, but it does require leadership. It does require a grants administrator. It is none of our jobs to do this individually. We are doing this for the better of our community and then the lack thereof. So in a vacuum, this is what we've created and we think we've created a best practice that can live on. Part of what we're gonna be doing for the remainder of the calendar year is building our own capacity um, to make sure we can live on for the next grants administrator to have some sort of structure so they can walk in the door running. Thanks. So I, I'll just note, I mean, we talk about grants a lot as though there's sort of free special money that we can just reach out and grab, but the reality is it's really hard to get grants and you have to meet the qualifications of the grant and people only want to fund certain types of projects. So, you know, people in the community will say, well, I want new sidewalks. Can't we just get a grant for that? But nobody wants to pay for that. <laughs> the people that are giving grants don't want to pay for that. So we have to choose projects that we think can be funded because we think there's somebody out there who wants to fund them. So that's sort of what drives the choices that this group, this committee has been making. And I appreciate their effort in looking at the grants that are available and trying to figure out what projects we have that might meet the requirements of that funder. So it's, um, it's a lot more difficult than finding magic money in a, in a pot of gold. So I appreciate your effort. We do need a motion for this one and it does need to be fast tracked. Commissioner, I'm sorry, can I break in just for a moment? This is Z Bishop with the legal department. I just wanna clarify here uh, what exactly we are moving forward because of course we've got 10 different projects listed and for these 10 projects, when we are actually going to pursue the grant funding, we do need to make sure that we have a resolution for each one of those and that those resolutions come back before the standing committee and then go to the uh, full commission. So I just want to make sure that we're clarifying what exactly we are voting on here today. I believe we are just approving this as the list of projects to pursue. Is that, that accurate? Word, yeah. That's what I thought. I was hoping these were the resolutions to get it all done so we didn't have to come back. So so there are no resolutions in the packet. Um, however, uh, with the agenda not being published until tomorrow, uh, if we can get it, I'm informed by uh, before nine o'clock, <laughs> we might be able to get this done. Well, we've got, it's track? 10 different uh, no. grants. It doesn't have to be fast, right? So I worry about it. I thought we were moving forward as if we didn't have to come back. If we don't, uh, not fast tracking it might incur another. Um, I don't think we have any deadlines ahead of us. The next deadline is at the end of May for mega intro. Um, Approval with the list that you have and fast track the Thursday. If we did not fast track it, would we have more time to write a resolution for all of these projects? Absolutely. If, if we did not, April 13th. Yeah. Uh, if it's okay with you all, and I apologize for the confusion on staff's part, but uh, absent the resolutions, I would just ask for your approval, and then we'll put together the resolutions for the Board of Commissioners next agenda in April. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Legal, is that clear enough for you to know what we're doing here? And I'll, I'll take the lead on working with Z or whoever at legal to, to write up some resolutions. And Thank just you. a point sorry. of order, I'm sorry. Or not a point of order, but a point of clarification for me. I had Patrice. I saw Patrice headed for the microphone. And then another individual. I was getting there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're I just thought I don't want to make sure that we are doing what staff needs us to do. And then there was another person headed for the microphone. <laughs> I just, yep. I don't know. You need to need from us. Yeah. Uh, Please give your name as well. Thanks. Patrice Townsend with the Board of Public Utilities. And we just wanted to say uh, we appreciate the unified government inviting us uh, to be a part of this grant um, application. Of course, we don't have a grant writer. The best would be me. And that's not good. 
So um, <laughs> we are just glad for the opportunity to be a part of this and uh, the countywide weatherization program. So we look forward to this and we thank everybody in your staff. They do a wonderful job and we thank them for allowing us to be part of it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Anyone else, if you're in public here, who would like to address the item? Sorry, I was just going to correct uh, Gunner for just a second. Oh, uh, the, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Erica Carter with iParametrics. And um, our next application is due at the end of April. So we, April 13th will still be fine. Um, one of the other benefits that I would like to point out to doing it this way is that we're also able to uh, collate data from multiple sites and multiple sources, which make our grant applications that much more compelling. So I look forward to us winning more in the future as well. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone else in person want to make comment? Please come to the podium. All right, Clerk, did we receive any comments or do we have anybody online? No comments, no hands raised. All right, we do have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Roll call, Kane. Aye. Stites? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Markley? Aye. Vote is five to zero. Thanks so much. All right. Item number four is a 2023 request for ARPA grant local match for raise by state and safe streets and roads for all. Mr. Hand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gunnar Hand, Director of Planning and Design. Um, so what we have before you is a, is a resolution. Got that one covered. Um, <clears throat> for uh, to seek funding out of the ARPA set aside for local match for grants. There's two that I'm asking for specifically in this resolution. The first one is for the $350,000 local match as a part of the UG's contribution to a regional $5 million planning grant. That is the raise phase one grant that we won last, that was announced last year for the bi-state corridor between the legends to downtown KCK, downtown KCK to downtown KCMO, and then downtown KCMO on to downtown Independence on a route still to be determined. That RFQ from the Mid-America Regional Council looks like they're going to push that out sometime this summer to begin consultant work on that. Um, this That ask is much farther along than the second ask. So what you have in your packet is a signed agreement by the former CAO um, to pursue, uh, to, to, to um, uh, venture into the regional memorandum of understanding between all the different agencies. So the bi-state corridor included the UG, Kansas City, Missouri, Jackson County, KCATA, and the City of Independence and the Mid-America Regional Council. Um, so that one's underway as a project. Um, and I can talk about that project if you have any questions specific to it. The second ask is a recently announced grant. Um, it, last fall, we applied for the Safe Streets for All for a Vision Zero Action Plan. That was the number one implementation action identified in the GoDOT Countywide Mobility Strategy. Um, that was a million dollar grant that we received, which is a $200,000 local match. This one's a little different because we're still waiting for the information from KDOT, Federal DOT, Department of Transportation, and others on next steps. So we know we've received it but we have no agreement signed. We have not moved forward with um, uh, really they're like, we're waiting for them to do webinars so that we can get this thing started as soon as possible is basically where we're at right now. So again, it's a little newer than that, but we are in, con in uh, effectively negotiations with the Kansas Department of Transportation who set aside their own ARPA dollars to provide additional local match for projects just like this um, one that are interjurisdictional, which this is, so uh, it'll be a countywide Vision Zero Action Plan, and two that are in um, disadvantaged uh, communities, which we are. Um, so we think we can get up to 150000 of that $200,000 local match from KDOT, but until we have that money in hand, we'd like to reserve um, up to $200,000, and then we can hopefully get that 150 from KDOT and only put in 50 and you, and this fund balance could get an extra $150,000 back. But until we have that secured, we wanted to ask for up to the full amount at $200,000. And again, I can ask questions, answer questions about both projects or the nitty gritty of the specific resolution as needed. Commissioner Bynum. Do they need uh, to be two separate motions? I believe legal wrote this as a single resolution. I would make a motion to approve the ARPA set aside 
to be used for local match. Does it need to fast track? Does it need to fast track? And to fast track it to March 30th. Everything says fast track today. <laughs> I need a second, or if there are questions. Second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Do I have any comments from anyone in our remaining public? Commissioner. No comments. I I, I do apologize. This is Z Bishop again from the legal department. Um, I'm not seeing a resolution in the packet. So do we have text of a resolution? Yeah, somewhere? it was it was sent. Unfortunately, I think this morning by legal. I have one. Okay. Okay. I just don't think that it made it into the packet. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure that we had text. Okay. We have one. Right. <clears throat> we get the we get the packet, right? And we're supposed to look at the packet. I've never had this happen in our meetings. It happened in the first meeting. Now it's happening in this one where they're clarifying what's going on. I want the legal department to read what they're supposed to get. And they're supposed to get whatever, whatever information you need for us to make the decision, which is great. But there seems to be a niche that we're missing right now to where they're not getting the information in a timely manner where we have to be corrected when we're going through this process. And I don't like it. Yeah, that's the one. I don't disagree. I appreciate that. All right, as, as it looks like some paperwork is coming around, uh, I don't think we have any hands up online. I, I'm, we didn't receive any comments. Do you have any public? Ready to take a moment and look at your resolution? Yeah, I know. And when Monica makes back around, if we don't have any questions, we will <laughs> um, we will vote. <laughs> don't run, don't run. <laughs> yeah, especially the legal jargon. Commissioner Markley, this is uh, Z Bishop from the legal department again. Our recommendation would be uh, once the members have had a chance to look at the text of this that you approve this as to form if in fact you you can uh, and then that would be sent to the commission um staff would be willing to not fast track this if you all need additional time as well i i don't that's your call Yeah, Commissioner, that this is Z Bishop again with the legal department. Uh, the agenda would go back out tomorrow. So if you want more time to be able to read through this, my recommendation would be that we not, not fast track it. So, and again, that would be the April 13th. Go for it. It'll be on the April 13th, right? Okay. Same as the other one. That makes sense. All right. Okay. So motion maker, you're good? Well, the motion. Oh, yeah. I'm good. She did. I made a second. Say, made a okay, second. I'm so good. Motion I'm good. maker and second are in agreement that we're yeah. proceeding to approve as a form. And and to send that to the April 13th meeting and not to fast track it. Okay, correct? very good. Thank you. Good? Yes. Z? Just another legal counsel. Okay. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Roll call. Kane? Spice? Ramirez? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Markley? Aye. Vote is five to zero. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thanks, Gunner. All right, item number five um, is actually an item I'm taking. Uh, I know, I told Arts Casey, you don't suffer through this, so I'll just take it. So I am chairing the Mayoral Committee on Arts and Culture, and we have a funding request. Our, um, to, we're requesting $20,000 from the Tourism Fund, which is that specialty fund that can only be used for tourism purposes. We're asking for that money to create an arts asset map. As a committee, what we found is that it's difficult to decide how to support our arts, where we should be adding arts and how to market our arts when we don't know what arts we have in the county. So um, Arts KC is a regional arts council that is already doing this work. They have a personnel in place um, and they're doing it for other counties for us to sort of piggyback on the effort that they already have going for these other counties. They're asking us to fund $20,000 worth of that person's um, efforts. It would mark, map all of our artists, art venues, um, art education opportunities and cultural 
venues and education opportunities and um, productions here within Wyandotte County for this arts committee's um, efforts. So that is the request and I am available for questions. Correct. I'll bet district five. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's getting late. We're getting I think grungy. I heard a motion in a second, right? Any additional questions, any comments from the public or comments that we've received, clerk? No comments received. Roll call, please. Roll call. Kane? Stites? Ramirez? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Markley? Aye. The vote Thank is very much. zero. My committee will appreciate your assistance. Uh, that brings us to item number six, which is strategic communications 2023 goals and plans. Ashley Hand has been patiently waiting to wrap up our meeting with us today. Welcome. All right. Good evening. My name is Ashley Hand. I'm the Director of Strategic Communications, and I'm joined online by Crystal McFetters, who is our Public Information Officer. Tonight, I am providing you an update with a 20 by 20 format, which means I have 20 seconds and 20 slides for each of those slides to get through this update for you. So I'm very excited to bring this update because I know it's been a long night for all of us. And I think it's really important to note that over the last couple of years since I joined the unified government, we've been doing a ton of experimentation, trying new ways of testing engagement, seeing what tools work, how can we reach out to the community and really try to launch new ways of thinking about how we can engage. So we not only wanna be an, an agent to help in that, the organization itself navigate change, we wanna be a catalyst for that change within the organization. So we know from an assessment that was done several years ago, which created my department, that we know communications is critical. We hear it in the community survey. We hear it in the employee survey. We've heard it in multiple assessments of our organization. There is so much more work to be done. We have a lot of low-hanging fruit as an organization, and we're very excited to work towards implementing a lot of these goals for you. Now, as of today, I'm very pleased to share that we have doubled in size as a team, which means that we've gone from a strapping team of two people to a team of four people to handle all communications, which will allow us this year to focus more explicitly on our digital presence. This is important as we think about how we attract new talent to the organization, how we attract new businesses to our community by having a strong digital presence. So we've been aligning our work with this comprehensive plan update that is happening this year as well. This is an opportunity for us to coordinate across multiple channels to ensure that we're working with multiple departments and aligning their engagement efforts in a way that we optimize engagement with our community. And that's important because right now it's sometimes difficult. You provide input to the community from the community. We don't necessarily what happens to that. So being able to translate that to how it impacts and shapes decision, decision making is important. It also can tell us a lot about how we're working. And so with all of the various channels, we know we have some limitations. And I think the most important thing to underscore here is not a single channel that we have reaches every single person that we have in, across the county. And that means that we have some challenges when it comes to effectively communicating with all of the folks across the community. So what we've been trying to do is identify ways to improve processes. Now, unfortunately, we just lost Commissioner Kane because this is really about improving the way that we workflow information within an existing system. If we can increase access, improve the way that we leverage technology to share information, you will have more information at your fingertips in a ready way. You'll also be able to ensure that our community has it, and we eliminate a lot of the steps that our clerk has to take. We also are looking at something called Gov Delivery. 
And what this will do is consolidate all of the different contact lists that various departments maintain into a single database. And this allows us to then do something that we haven't done a lot of, which is audience segmentation. So your interest as a member of our community is defined by what you tell us you want to hear. And then we provide the information that you want to your inbox. So this is a huge opportunity to not only engage departments in a different way, especially those without their own capacity for communications, to provide us with information, provide us with updates, and then we have a platform for disseminating that through email. The challenge that we've had is with so many legacy systems, we have a lot of things out there that aren't managed effectively. Now this new Gov Delivery will allow the cities of Bonner Springs, our neighborhood groups to post events and provide information about what's happening so that we as an organization can become the reliable go-to resource for all things Wyandotte County. Another exciting thing through the work of Crystal has been really unpacking our capabilities with UGTV. Video is king in the era of digital content. So it's really important for us to have a solid video capability. We know that UGTV is not only available through Spectrum uh, Cable, but it's also available through Apple and Roku, opening up a world of uh, an, an audiences that we have never touched before. We've been working closely with various departments on things like improving our community survey. I don't know about you, I see it as a very valuable tool. It becomes very kind of a potentially uh, effective way of tracking our progress and, and customer satisfaction, but we need to make the questions legible and useful to us as an organization. And by bringing in training to all the different departments about how to leverage the tools that we have, how to be effective communicators, we can start to make all of our employees part of the communication solutions that we need for our organization. So we've been rolling out these small scale trainings, including uh, um, some of the kind of standards that we're starting to implement, which will be fully implemented through the launch of brand guidelines later this year, which includes templates and training and standard operating procedures just to simplify some of the challenges that come with communicating because not everybody considers that their job, but all of us have a responsibility to share that information and data. And finally, as we are starting to kind of find our place within the organization, we have to kind of get rid of some of the inherited things that we have, like our budget. Our budget is basically derived on a business model we no longer operate with, and frankly, does not meet the needs of our organization, particularly when you look at things like our physical assets and how we manage our communications technology. We currently have, this is the production booth downstairs in the chambers, um, those computers we can't support. A, a monitor that we can't actually see, and we don't even have staff to produce the, the meetings for us. So we have some pretty structural changes that we need to continue to work through. And we're super excited to continue to progress this work along this framework of fostering culture, improving our capabilities, and ultimately enhancing our structure so that we can be more responsive and focus on continuous improvement because there is no end state. We know that we have to keep working and we will always have the challenge of needing to do more and more communications. So why, uh, of course, I need to kind of end this with a call to action to you all. I would never leave without asking for your help. Your stories, your engagement with businesses and local residents makes a big difference when it comes to sharing what's happening and what's special about us as Why Not County. So I encourage you to work with us to find ways to share what's happening from your perspective, and we can help you with aligning it to the right channels. So that was a 20 by 20. That was six minutes and 40 seconds, and all you ever need to know about strategic communications, but I am open for questions if you have them. There was no time for breathing. No. <laughs> no time. No. My last name is Hand. <laughs> Used to be Zarella, which is why I moved my hands. So. Uh, yeah. yes, please bring us back down to earth. <laughs> I don't think I could speak that fast, but we, we'll see. Right. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Markley. Thank you, Ashley, for everything that you and your department uh, do. Um, you do an amazing job of getting information out there and knowing what needs to be done for our community. <laughs> um, one thing, I, I don't know really what kind of going, it, it came to me when you're talking about the go delivery and uh, or the gov delivery and um, reaching out and you know helping our constituents 
get information and get the help that they need. Mm-hmm. Um, and I never really knew where I could bring this idea um, for us as a board, as a commission. When we have we have no CRM. Yes. We have no constituent yes. software to yes. track problems, make sure we don't know when was the last time staff looked into it. Just it's something I've been thinking of. Yeah. Because we have an issue, we either get an email or a phone call, yeah. and then we send another email or a phone call. And it, there's no system of us to track any of that. And I would love to have something like that because it's not going to lie. There may be some issues that come before me mm-hmm. and then there's another issue that comes and then that just issue gets lost in my, yeah. lost in my list of things having to take care of. And so it's, I, I would like to have a system where I can see where the complaint, where the issue is at, at a certain time frame, whose desk it's at, yeah. whose office it's in, yeah. so that we can provide those updates to constituents. Um, I would love that. And again, I don't know if this, your department is perfect, but I feel it does yeah. Us communicating with our constituents. Absolutely. So I would say Gov Delivery is the start and may not be a full blown CRM as a customer relationship management software would be, but it will give us the opportunity to start to look at some of the metrics around what type of engagement we get, what type of messages are working. We can do some A B testing to see this one resonated. People clicked on the image here. People really like the button there. That gives us a little bit more fine tuning. But the, um, one of the things that the organizational assessment initially suggested was that 311 come under strategic communications. And I have been working a little bit with them just initially on trying to kind of open up some of the lines of communications. I think there is a lot of possibility in terms of rethinking the technology that supports our 311 because a lot of that accountability and tracking are functions of a lot of other 311 systems across the country. The ability even as a resident to go back and look up your ticket and see where it is in the queue is important. That type of open data can really transform the number of calls we get, the number of calls you get, but also the ability to say, oh yes, I see your ticket here and this is where it's at. Those are really important customer service relationships that we need to be cultivating. We're currently in a position where 311 is having kind of interim management, no real supervisor role right now in, in, that's being filled. So I think there's a lot of opportunity, and we are very excited to continue working with 311 and trying to improve that with the ultimate goal of getting to a better CRM. Oh, I, I, I appreciate that because it's we, we as commissioners don't get staff. Yeah. Other elected officials in the building gets a absorbent amount yeah. of staff, and you know our the ladies Deanna and Lisa they do an amazing job yeah. of doing what they can. But there's ten of there's yeah. there's there's nine of us. Yeah, and to have two ladies for nine commissioners, mm-hmm. and it's that's just something I've had on my mind a lot is yeah. us being able to handle our issues yeah. as commissioners and when the constituents come to us <laughs> um, uh, constituents come to us with the issues and be able to stay on top of yeah. and stay on track not for staff but just me as an elected being able to and I absolutely and I, I want to meet you to see if there's something I can implement yes in my I have ideas And I do think one of the advantages of having a more rigorous kind of customer relationship management strategy as an organization is you can also do things like look at where incidents are occurring and start to understand, is this because we have someone who's had a bad week and had an issue and we're going to be, we're going to respond as a government in kind, or are we going to come down hard because we know this has been someone who's a habitual violator of the rules. And those are the types of things that you can start to pull out of data when you track it. And that also, we can also look things, many cities have done this, when you start to look at that data at a neighborhood or district level, you start to see, oh my goodness, there's trends in certain things that are happening. We need to go in and be more specifically responsive on this issue because we're seeing it happen. And we don't have a lot of that data mining um, uh, capabilities with the way that 311 is structured and then they have to push out tickets to other departments. It's it's a bit convoluted and there's a lot of manual labor that introduces errors into the data, which is problematic. And we're trying to eliminate that will make a big difference. Well, we do have a lot of issues. <laughs> Commissioner Bynum. Um, it's a really good point you make, even though it's late and we're kind of giggly, but, but to your point, 
Um, gosh, we wouldn't ask you to take on more, but maybe if you do have some some tips, because it is really, really difficult to track even just the issues that are coming into me, you know, yeah. and like you said, find out yeah. where in the pipeline is that, or is it even in a pipeline? But um, so I do appreciate it. Um, but I wanted to say thank you to you and Crystal most specifically. And if you've doubled in size, welcome to the two new people. That's very exciting. Yes. Um, I'm, I don't want to say I'm most excited, but I'm very excited about the brand guideline. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be working um, across the departments and hopefully with us. Yes. Make sure that we all understand the branding standards. Absolutely. That developed and those that already exist. I mean, even just looking at the the UG logo on mm -hmm. that slide that says launch brand guideline. Mm -hmm. I see a slight adjustment and change to the logo <laughs> as far as the color. It just looks you better. Know, the two different tones. Yep. Yeah, it's on this navy blue background. Is that so? We have a couple of options. Yeah, we're working towards having templates for things like slide presentations, as well as memos and things like that. Email signatures, things like that. There's a lot of ADA accessibility issues that we run into without having some of those standards in place. We're really eager to ensure that whether you have you're on a machine that's reading it to you or um, have vision problems, that you have no issue accessing information from us. It's awesome. Thank you. Other questions for Ms. Hand? If not, this item was for information only. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you for being quick. And uh, that concludes our meeting for the evening. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. I have a motion to second. Roll call, please. Roll call. Kane. Stites. Aye. Ramirez. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Markley. Aye. The vote is five to zero. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.